Hello folks and welcome to our game on this Monday afternoon with South Shane Sales. I'm joined as ever by Michael Verney, brought to you by OrgaRetro.com. Look at these retro jerseys we've got today. They're looking absolutely sweet. Uh, we've got Joe Canning coming live on the show today, so a great time to have the Galway retro jersey on. Uh, we have a huge selection of jerseys over at uh, OrgaRetro.com. A great site, 15% off with the promo code our game. We had a fairly dramatic weekend of it, Michael Verney, did we not? We did. I was <laughs> I was stuck down in Kinnegan while a lot of the drama was happening. Um, and had to kind of make my own fun down there. Uh, but by all accounts, what was happening up at HQ and particularly the, the close the minutes uh, of the football final was was unbelievable. I didn't think anything could probably rival the close of minutes of maybe last year's football final. But as you said there, uh, and I, I rarely give you credit, but I give you credit this time. It was up on the Our Game website. What was the headline you had for the for the football final? Wheel oh. turns for Ferris. Beautiful. Yeah, I mean, the Ferris wheel is turning. It, like it, it really was a magical finish for him because, like that save from uh, from Connor Glass. Now, I still maintain that I think Glass should have finished it no matter what. You know, and you know the glass was half empty this time. No, I'm not. I'm not trying to to you know make fun or anything like that. But it was a huge chance. It should have been buried. And but what an incredible save at the same time. Like both sides of it there, incredible save, but probably should have been finished. And can you imagine if it had to happen two years in a row to Crokes? Yeah, it, it was mad to think, obviously, and we didn't really talk about actually in the in the build up to the game that you know the two beaten finalists from twenty twenty two were back in twenty twenty three and both kind of exacted revenge, not necessarily on the same opponents or anything like that, but uh, had obviously a miserable experience there last February and had you know one of the most glorious days in both of their clubs' history yesterday. Um, the Connor Glass chance was just looking back at it, looked back at it several times. It's one of those moments. I don't know if you've ever had it in a game where. Uh, it almost was like time stood still after he kicked the ball. And like it, it, I, he didn't connect with it badly, but it just seemed like there was so much time from when it left his boot to when it nearly went in to when it didn't go in. He, like you're, li- you are literally. It's rare in the game you're literally standing, nearly looking like that, and that's that's what it was. And fairness to Ferris, you can't ask for anything more than a keeper getting down low to the corner and turning it around. From from Glass's point of view, um, obviously. He, he will be disappointed and obviously a player of his class would normally put away a chance like that. It's not as if he fluffed his lines or anything like that, just probably didn't maybe connect as nicely as he would have had. Uh, and I see that those pictures coming up on the screen. There was a, uh, a great picture the Crooks, uh, the Crooks Twitter had up of Rory O'Carroll standing on the, the kind of dais in, in, in 20, was it 2009, standing yeah. up with, with the trophy and then doing the same yesterday. Older, obviously a bit more experienced, but... Uh, like I'm sure him in particular, he would have taken. There it is. There, like it's a, br- it's a brilliant picture. Uh, things have probably things have changed a bit for him and changed a bit for Crooks since then. But uh, absolutely unbridled joy for them yesterday, no doubt. Yeah, and there's a picture of Connor Ferris. I mean, you can imagine the difference in his emotions yesterday compared with uh, last year against Kilku. That's not to to blame him entirely for what happened against Kilku because no. you know he drove the ball out, but other lads had you know a huge amount of opportunities to get tackles in. But so it was. It was, a, it was a tough one for him on that day. And I think any player who was in his position would probably take that really, really hard. But um, yeah, brilliant win for Crokes for a finish. But like all this talk now of a replay, uh, potentially because they had 16, maybe even 17 players, if you want to include, uh, was it Dara Mullen or was it Paul Mannion who was at the side and hadn't quite got off the pitch yet? Where do you lie when it comes to should, like, I mean, the club have been asked and there was a statement put out. I, I'll go and check that in a second. Malachi O'Rourke straight after the game. He wasn't overly inclined towards it, but where do you stand when it comes to this? I I'm not a I'm not a kind of a rules a rules merchant when it comes to something like this. What I would probably come back to is whether it had any effect on the play or any impact in the final result, and I don't think it did, or definitely not in any way directly did it have any effect on them not being able to get a leveling score or protect or a winning score in the case of a goal. Um, so I I. I'm not as clear cut as oh a rule was, I, I presume a rule rule was broken. Obviously, I I can't believe it though that you know whatever about this in you know a college's game where there's consternation on a sideline and there's loads of lads coming or going and there's no fourth official for this to happen in Crow Park is absolutely bonkers in an All yeah. Ireland club final uh, and it's just not acceptable at all. They're all mic'd up together. They're all uh, in constant communication together. Something like this just should not happen. A a basic rule of thumb, nobody goes on until somebody goes off. It's the the most basic rule of thumb when it comes to substitutions. And all of a sudden, on 
the biggest club day of the year, this is allowed to happen and shouldn't happen. Yeah, so I put up a poll yesterday. So do you think Glenn should look for an All-Ireland final replay clash with Kilmacud Croaks? Uh, yes, rules are rules, says 60%. And no, it didn't affect the results, uh, Results said just under 40%. That was 1,566 votes. So, you know, a lot of people seem to feel... And I, I do wonder, though, is that sort of... There's a bit of an anti-super club um, sort of a leaning in that as well. I think a lot of people would nearly just like to see Croaks have to go through it because people are maybe annoyed that Shane Walsh um, joined or the perception of a super club or the affluent area or whatever. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, though, but I, I feel like some votes would definitely go that way because of that. Uh, in Gaelic Life, the chairman of Glen, Barry Slowey, said, we'll be seeking clarification from the GA and check all facts before we make any decision on the way forward. So it may not be the end. I see a comment here from A. Sully 180. The most likely outcome will be a fine for Kilmacud. Yeah, uh, imagine if you were on the beer last night and you're on the beer today and official GA communications comes through and say, just say tomorrow morning at 12 o'clock when you're low as a snake's belly and the game, has been, the game has been replayed next week. Like, I mean, from a winning point of view, you're low, but you're high, like you're, you're low from just carnage, no sleep, uh, a lot of porter. And you wake up on the Tuesday morning and, you know, I don't know, a message pops through from Robbie Brennan into the WhatsApp group saying this game has been replayed next Saturday or Sunday. Um, it'd, be a bit, it'd be a bit of a mad one. I just, I just, I find it very hard to believe that there will be a replay. Um, I think the GA need to come out and put their hands up here. Um, I don't know. If, I don't, is, is, like, is this a, is this a kill my cut problem or is this a GA problem in the sense of, like, did, if it was Darren Mullen or if it was Paul, Mann, if it was Darren Mullen, shall we say, it should have been off. Like, does, is it his duty to know that he is coming off the field or is it someone else's duty to make sure that he is off the field before the play continues? I'm sure it's not a case of no one would stay on on purpose and jeopardise the win, if you get me. Do you know Wouldn't what I mean? They? No, I'm not saying in this case, but I think people would. I think oh, maybe maybe I I wouldn't because I think it's I think it's madness. I think if you're going to lose, I don't think you know an extra person being on the field is going to make that much of a difference. But if you're found to have an extra person on the field, there's a great potential that you're going to lose the game or lose your winning position, and a new game is going to have to start all over again. I think that's a bit of a mad one, but I do think that I do think the GA need to put their hands up here and admit that this was a serious fault uh, on their behalf. Yeah, like with some amount of people commenting, I suppose, viewing like 270,000 views on this uh, tweet, the image that we put up last night and the amount of commentary and people say, well, like I would imagine it is the club's duty to make sure that they don't have 16 players on the field. Because if you put it on uh, the authorities, then people will be more likely to sort of seek and uh, get away around it. Um, I, I do think there are players who, like wasn't it the 1995 All-Ireland when Charlie Redmond was sent off and he didn't go off straight away and stayed on for an extra few minutes? Um, ML89 said there's a precedent for a replay. Leash and Armagh had to replay a game a few years ago with similar incident and Mead had to replay the Christy Ring final after getting the trophy and celebrations and of course Offaly 1998. Yeah, yeah. people are never uh, never short of a reason to bring that one up now in fairness. It's obviously 25 years uh, this year as well um, and I kind of wanted, why, what I was saying there earlier about getting the message about the replay, you know, the Offaly lads I think the Offaly lads were on about training that Monday and a couple of them definitely weren't going training. They were going to uh, let their hair down, so to speak. And then word came through that there was a replay coming. I think Johnny Pickin then still didn't go to training because he was, shall we say, too far gone at that stage. Um, <laughs> but but uh, that was, and it's amazing. It's amazing what would the momentum changes or shifts if the game were to be replayed. Glenn would have another shot at Kilmacud. Like there, we're in an All-Ireland final at that stage. Kilmacud have a trophy. And imagine having to give the trophy back and go to play to win it again. Uh, John Collins says, Crokes didn't sneak a player on. They didn't cheat. The officials allowed play to restart before the substitutions were closed off. Unfair, to be honest, in my opinion, that Crokes are fined. One of the players, uh, says Adrian McGrath, who should have been gone, was on the goal line, for God's sake, Vernie. A Crokes team that panics in the last minute had an extra, had an extra man in there. So did, he know, did he know he was taken off? Like, that, that's, I, 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 we don't even know that, whether he knew he was supposed to be off the pitch or not. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You do see Darren Mullen. He's number fourteen there, just to to the left side of the goals there, left of the middle, just under the black spot, more or less. Look, I I don't think uh, any players were trying. I just think it was one of those honest errors. I don't see there being a replay over this. Maybe there'd be sort of a nominal fine, but um, just even in terms of the game itself, 
If you were told, if you told the Glen beforehand that you'd hold both Paul Mannion and Shane Walsh scoreless from play, you'd think you're going to be winning this game. But still, I mean, obviously there was the penalty for Shane Walsh. Seemed it just like, did you think that was inside or outside? I'd see pe different people uh, giving out about where the foul actually took place. But I thought it was a bit of a, a crazy foul, I have to say. But overall, Croaks created 27 chances to 17. Uh, Mannion got him, popped over a free for himself. Shane Walsh obviously knocked over a few frees as well as the penalty. You know, like after the first 15 minutes, wh at, at which stage Glenn were 1 3 to a point ahead, they didn't even create a scoring chance for the rest of the half. So the second half, the first half, they didn't even create a chance. And it was just complete takeover from um, from Croaks. And if Aidan Jones had to score that goal at the start of the second half, maybe they would have cruised away. But it still was a brilliant game. And I would have said that, and I don't know what you think, but I think physically, if you look at the players and maybe the quality of the game, it was closer to inter-county standard than maybe the club hurling final was. because I, I And maybe this is because the pitch was obviously not in great state. Maybe it's more of a factor in the hurling because when you're trying to lift the ball up off the ground, it'll still come up easier on a bad football uh, on a bad pitch in football than it will in, in hurling. So maybe that's part of the reason. Yeah, we get into the pitch in a minute, maybe when we when we talk more about the hurling final. But uh, it was a re it was a, I only got to watch the highlights back this morning of uh, the football. I got to watch the, all of the hurling, but it was a really exciting game and any sort of a game for a trophy where it's tight. Uh, and you're not sure who's going to win down the stretch. It's always going to be interesting. Uh, Shane Walsh was obviously quiet from play, but how important, you know, borderline or otherwise, how important was the penalty? Because they were in a bit of trouble at that stage. Just say that penalty had been saved. Uh, they're five. They're five points down. Um, they obviously had a, a you know they've missed a, a clear cut goal chance. Maybe the, the game would have been a, a little bit different then. But it all the momentum kind of started building at Crocs at that stage. And like I know they conceded a goal at the end of the of extra time against Kilku last year but they did finish the game really really strongly uh did they kick the last four points they kick the last four points of the game i think um of the, yeah they, they they were down one nine to um, oh yeah croaks did yeah yeah they, they one nine to one seven they kicked the next four points and i know you could say they were hanging on to some respect at the end and they obviously ferris had to pull off the save from glass but they did finish you know they finished really strong and we've talked about you know the absence of Mannion and Shane Walsh being quiet in other games. It was, uh, you know, as as you'd say, as we used to say about like some of them on the Sunday game. It was your Dara Mullins. It was your Shane Horns. It was all these lads like Shane Horn coming in, winning a free, getting on a couple of possessions. That's the quality of the player they're able to call upon. So why while, while they might not all be, you know, Dublin stars or whatever, or Shane Walsh might have been quiet. It was all the other lads that have probably really driven the thing, maybe. In, you know, not as obviously maybe a Shane Walsh or Paul Mannion has, but they were absolutely driving the gesture and they were key. And I thought Mullen was outstanding. No, he was, yeah. So it was, I thought Keane O'Connor brought a lot of drive as well when he came off the bench. Uh, Shane Cunningham, very good as always. Um, and Shane Walsh definitely did um, tire out the defence at times, so I thought he was quite good. Shane, just a um, quick question there. There was a comment in uh, asking whether the substitution was announced over the Tannoy. Did you hear that in the grounds? Well, like how often, like generally, I do, you, you would hear the substitutions being announced, but at that stage of the game, I, I can't remember. Pandemonium, it's honestly the, sure, isn't it really? Like, yeah, yeah, and I mean, you, regularly, you you know, you might hear the odd substitution, you mightn't pay, you know, and then if you're trying to look back and remember, you're just not going to re recall whether it happened or not. So I don't know. Um, Richard Hogan says it's a GA problem. The game shouldn't begin until the players have left the field. What was the fourth official doing in this instance? And Again, the fourth official had an, an assistant of sorts as well overseeing him. Like there was a there's a couple of people, there's definitely three to four people that shouldn't have allowed this to happen. It's a simple like it's it's roll on, roll off. The person comes off first, then the player goes on. Like you've been annoyed trying to get on to games, get into games before, where they actually will not let you in until the person is crossing the line. And you're tick at the time, but it's fair enough. It's to prevent something like what happened yesterday. And it shouldn't have been allowed to happen in Crow Park. Whatever about, you know, some underage schools games where there's, you know, a hundred lads on the sideline and it's, you know, the slips coming left, right and centre. This is Crow Park. Like, th these things should not happen. It's all so official. And there's so many people there to look after all these jobs and prevent it from happening. So it, sh it just shouldn't have happened. And I hope they put the hand up and fess up and admit their mistake in this as well. Yeah, ML89 says, thought it was poor form uh, from the ref to play no extra time after Crokes made four subs and added time. There was about 30 seconds of actual time uh, play, actual added time played. Um, should we move on to the, the hurling? Yeah, we will. I, I, before we even go, like obviously Barry Hale 
won their won their ninth All Ireland. It's a, an unbelievable achievement for them. But like the spectacle you mentioned there, the spectacle was definitely hurt by the pitch. There's no point in saying any different. And we flagged it up in advance. The pitch was not in good shape uh, last Saturday or last Sunday for the intermediate junior double in hurling and football. And it was in more it was in worse shape. And I know Pat Hogan, Hogan took a bit of a broadside at the pitch after. You might go through it there. Like it's it just it, it isn't good enough really for the biggest club day of the year where you have the best hurlers in the country unable to go down with one hand to pick a ball. I've, I've never seen as many roll lifts in a game in Crow Park in my life. And lads yeah, realised quickly, they went down with the jab lift and it just wasn't coming up and had to roll lift. I, I've never seen that many roll lifts in, in a big game. Yeah, and like at times you're like, why are you roll lifting the ball? But there's obviously a good reason for it. These teams didn't get this far just, you know, by going with the bad habits of <laughs> will the Will you get your arse in and roll? Get your arse in and roll it, will you? And so Pat Hoven said afterwards, normally when you walk out here, you're in awe of the place. These guys, it's our fourth game in a row here. We've been very, very lucky, but it's definitely the worst condition we've seen it in. I know nothing about the, uh, keeping pitches, but they never seem to leave the grass grow here for an all Ireland final. If that was a pitch, you wouldn't train that. Garth Brooks, whatever he did, I think they laid a new pitch after it. Normally that pitch is like a carpet, you're bouncing on it. Whereas there, the lads were even, uh, were, were even saying to fall on it. It's as hard as a rock. It's disappointing, I'd say, and tell you, it looks like guys are fumbling and making small mistakes, but it's like trying to rise the ball on tarmac. Unfortunately, it is important Nick, for our Premier pitch. Um, well, look, obviously, the it probably just hasn't had a chance to grow properly, and maybe there just hasn't been enough sunlight. Obviously, there's been daylight, but maybe there just hasn't been enough of a chance for it to grow properly since what happened with the Garth Brooks concerts. Um, the other thing is that there's been so many unnecessary games played there. I mean, wh why have... Uh, Ballyhale played four games in a row there. Why have Kilmacud Croaks made, played maybe eight of their last 10 games? You know, that's not an exact figure, but give or take outside of Dublin in that venue. There's no need for it at all. Also, these games are massively lost in, in Croke Park. I mean, yesterday, like, you don't ever want to deny club players the chance to play an All-Ireland final in Croke Park, but it's not a suitable venue even for these games. I mean, it probably would be better off in a place like Turles, for example. Think of how magic the minor All-Ireland final was last year because it was in Nolan Park or other finals in other venues. The likes of, um, wasn't it, Bell and Derry played their All-Ireland final in two, uh, 2002 in uh, Thurless because of the redevelopment of Croke Park. We had our replay in 2018 in Port Leash, and, you know, that added to the memory as far as I'm concerned. So um, there's part of me that thinks maybe Croke Park is no longer suitable, but the other part is like, yeah, it's the biggest game of all time for a club player, so it should be at Croke Park. So I'm just a small bit torn on that one. Yeah, I've I've no issue whatsoever with the All Ireland final being played in Crow Park. I just have an issue with semi finals, provincial finals, provincial semi finals. Like there's a load of traffic on the pitch that is kind of unnecessary, really. And as you say, you're putting um, you know, what maybe would have been six or seven thousand for some of those attendances into a big, huge stadium like Crow Park. There's probably no need for it. I think there was a good of about twenty three there yesterday, and there was a good atmosphere. There's something about a club final where you always hear those uh, foghorns. It's, I don't know, and particularly when... It's annoying. Uh, yeah, ah, yeah, but there's plenty, there's plenty of noise, at least. Um, but I have no issue with the All-Ireland Finals being played there. I think all players, in particular, would, would want to be playing there. And I think fans love going up, but it was I, I just think it was unnecessary for a lot of the other games. And I think they suffered the effects of that yesterday. They suffered the effects of it the previous Sunday and the previous Saturday as well, when conditions should have absolutely been prime for what is the biggest club day of the year. And just a, a little brief aside as well. I was in Kinnegad yesterday, as I was saying, and Eddie Gibbons, Dara Purcell and Fergal Whiteley were all playing for Dublin in a, a, you know, a meaningless dead rubber Walsh Cup game while their club, Kilmacoy Crokes, were playing in an All-Ireland Club final, you know, some... Uh, 70 or 80 kilometers away in Crow Park. And I just think, I just think it's an absolute crying shame that, you know, f fixtures couldn't be scheduled to allow. I put you this way Henry Shefflin would have gone bonkers if Galway were playing at two o'clock yesterday while Ballyhale were playing in the All Ireland Club final. Like mm. he would have had. And he's, I think he's probably, you know, uh, maybe. TJ is kind of uh, up there with him now, but he's the, one of the greatest players in the history of their club. One of two of the best players. Imagine not being able to go to the game because you're involved with somebody else. Like, I don't see why that game couldn't be played on Saturday, why he couldn't have even been played at, you know, half 12 yesterday or 12 o'clock yesterday. And that's, I'm not just talking about those three lads. Like, everybody wants to see the club finals. Everybody that's, that's a GA player 
Um, and that you're all, you're taking a lot of Dublin fans that want to see the hurling. They're going to go down and support their county. Same with Westmead. Uh, same with the Offaly uh, Leash game that was on yesterday. Same with Tip and same with Cork. And a lot of those lads, the minute you're chatting them after the game, the first thing, if they know you, to be like, who won the club final? You know what I mean? It's, I just think it's it's a mad scenario. It never happened on St. Patrick's Day because nothing else was on and it shouldn't happen now either. This, I think yesterday should have been a club day and a club day alone. Yeah, and look, as I've said to you before, I think this uh, month should just be for college competitions. Pretty soon, it'll be uh, December all Ireland Club Finals. So nothing, you, you would imagine nothing will be up against it. But my, if my memory serves me correctly, last year, you know, we had Dara Purcell with the UCD Freshers, and I'm pretty sure he was even training with the, the football team as they were on their All-Ireland run last year, getting all the way to the final. So you can imagine then the fact that he would be very close and have trained with an awful lot of these lads and maybe under dis- different circumstances would have also been talking yesterday. Like, that's a very difficult one for, for the likes of him and, and, and obviously the other lads as well would no doubt like to be there. There was uh, a tongue in cheek comment, Shane, that a lot of the boys wouldn't even know each other within the club, but hinting at how big the club is or whatever. Mm. But they're all training in the same places. They're all back in the clubhouse after. Like, I put you this way the three lads I mentioned that were playing for Dublin would have been back in, you know, the clubhouse in their grounds after the Leinster final. The hurlers lost, obviously, but went down valiantly. The footballers won. They would have been celebrating together. They would have been commiserating together. And, like, I just, I just think it's a shame that, you know, they wouldn't be able to go and support their own support their own club and their own kind of club mates in what is, you know, one of the biggest days in the club's history. And, I, yeah. and Cassius King is right, because obviously there's loads of Dunlai lads involved, several of them involved with the Antrim squad. Those lads, if their game had been played yesterday, they would have been going mad, and rightfully so. But that game was played Saturday, I'm just wondering why. I think every every game that was played over the weekend should have been played on Saturday. Yeah, who who stood out for you in the in the club all Ireland hurling final? Like I I would say obviously with one five on Cody's top of the list, but that wrecking ball Colin Colin Fenley in the first half he had his fingerprints all over a few of those uh, different goal chances. I thought he was really really good as well. I'm banging the same beef again and again, but Colin Conning was one of Dunlay's most dangerous men, and he just didn't get a sniff off Joey Holden again. Mm. Like how many times has he done this in the last? You know, in the last 10 years since he broke onto the scene where he just quietens the lad. And it'd be interesting to chat to, chat to Joe when he's on the show in a couple of minutes. Joe had a couple of battles with him, obviously, in the, the, four, the, the 15 Leinster final, the 15 All-Ireland final as well. But he's just so, he's just unspectacular, but just does his job brilliantly every time. And I thought he was, I thought he was going to get the nosebleed near the end. He went up and I thought he was going to try and shoot for a point. But typical of him... And how kind of understated and how much of a team player he is. He was up there and he could have taken a shot. All he wanted to do was give a pass. He had no interest in the lights. He had no interest in scoring and crow parking. Are you calling him windy? No, I'm not calling him windy. I'm calling him just, he, he probably maybe, not knows his limitations, but he just wouldn't see, he wouldn't see himself like that. He'd just give the ball to the, the next best man. And um, I, that could be his last game of hurling at senior level, realistically. The idea is to head off for two to three years. That was the initial plan. And I'd imagine now, you know, obviously he had the, the, the really sad bereavement of his dad and he came back for that. And look at what spiralled after that. And I'm sure that his dad would have been immensely proud of him yesterday. And as well as that, I know Owen Cody referenced Paul Shefflin and the last game that Paul Shefflin had, had seen Bally Hale play before he pa- suddenly passed away was that club final. There would have been so many lads that say smiling down on all those Bally Hale lads yesterday. Um... And just as we said, uh, we said in the, the previous show, we left out one fella, but Colin Fenley, TJ, Owen Reid and Mark Aylward now have six All-Ireland club medals, like six All-Ireland club medals, two more than any other club outside of the Shamrocks. Like that's, it's unbelievable, really. Yeah, I think it was five shots that uh, Dunloy dropped short. Sometimes lads yeah. take forcing shots that were absolutely not on. Other times, maybe miss hits. Uh, a couple of times, lads were blocked down. They'll definitely have... You know they'll definitely be pining over some of those missed chances. I saw um, Gregory O'Kane was was tweeting late last night about his, you know, how proud he was of the boys, and you know this isn't the end of the journey. I think that was generally sort of the tone of it, and like they were really excellent because you know they were written off across the board. I don't think we wrote them off. Like we had the tactics board up the other day, we were looking at where we thought they might get some wins, uh, where they could uh, hurt Shamrocks, but we both did feel that ultimately that would be the the way that it would go back to. Kilkenny three titles in four years which you know only uh, Portumna have done in recent times as well so that's that's very impressive from from the club like six goal chances to Bally Hale just one for Dunloy and that was early in in the game and it was a great finish from Ronan Malloy it's actually a brilliant move 
Shan Elliott was quite good. I think one or two chances just didn't quite happen for him. Jeez, that, you talk about defenders coming up when Oren Quinn sold it up mm. during the, was it the first half or the second half? I can't first remember half, which. Yeah. yeah, and eventually popped it over the bar. That was a very nice score. Uh, Paul Shields, just like when he came on the semi final, I thought he was brilliant in this game. Um, uh, Keelan Malai was quite good. Probably hoped to get on a little bit more ball. But they, they were good. But uh, geez, Shamrocks, just like Croaks in the other game, last four scores, you know, they were, yeah. they were obviously just a little bit ahead. Uh, but they created more chances, 43 chances to 29 in terms of creation. That kind of tells you, like, was, was there part of you thinking that the effort that Dunloy had put in, the brilliant effort they'd put in, that ultimately in the last few minutes just, I don't know, maybe they just ran out of juice just a small bit? did look like it um, and it was just a barrage of, of uh, Ballyhale scores at the end there was a there was a period in the second half um, about six or seven minutes where there was a, just a couple of chances that to me just sucked all the oxygen out of Dunlai remember Keelan Malai was going through uh, he was kind of going down the left flank down the Hogan stand side and it was for a split second there was a man in the middle and it was a hand pass across and it was a potential goal chance yeah uh, I think he was fa- I think he was fouled but he missed the runner I think that was a good goal chance uh, Colin Cunning had a free in the 49 minute drop short. Uh, Nigel Elliott dropped a shot short in the 50th minute. And uh, like to me, I know you mentioned Keelan Malai was good, Cunning was okay. But like Ronan Malai, if you'd said beforehand that Ronan Malai would probably be their best forward when you're thinking of Nigel Elliott, uh, Shan Elliott, Keelan Malai, uh, Colin Cunning, that would have been a surprise. And a lot of their, the guys that we probably flagged up before the game. They definitely didn't hit the heights they did in the semi final, anyway. Yeah, and like even Darren Mullen, Darren Mullen coming on late yeah. on, what an impact he had. And they did this all without having Adrian Mullen. And Brian Cody was also good when he came off the bench. By the way, just uh, uh, while I think of it, we should mention that David Moran has announced his retirement from Kerry. You know, obviously, he had such an injury ravaged start to his career, wasn't it? Two cruciates he'd done, but then ultimately became such a brilliant player for him as the years went on. I think an all star in 2014. I uh, remember that game he played against Mayo uh, down in the Gaelic grounds. Was it something like 32 possessions, maybe even more? Uh, and, of course, most recently then, even for his club, Karen Zorahli, unbelievable performance in defiance against Kilmacud Croke. So that's that's a bit of a blow for Kerry. Yeah. Um, Jack Savage has gone back to Dubai as well. So he's going to be gone too. The Cliffords are taking a bit of a rest. So you're definitely not going to see the best of Kerry, I'd say, during the league. From, from David Moran's point of view, like I know they were beaten by Crocs, but I'd say he would have taken immense satisfaction from uh, maybe exercising some de- Crow Park demons from the All Ireland final when he was taken off at half time. Like he lauded it in Crow Park, and you know, it's probably his last big game ever, ever to play in Crow Park for Clover County. And to me, the best way to go out is to probably go out when people say that you still have something to offer. Do you know what I mean? Rather than he needs to go or whatever. So um, I don't know if he had his decision made before that that day, but I'm sure, and I'm sure Jack O'Connor tried to coax him back since. But uh, yeah, he's been a, an unbelievable servant. He was he was a real kind of old school midfielder, wasn't he? He was the sort of lad that there were just times where the midfield, it looked like you just could not get the ball around him. you know. And the game has probably changed and is based a lot more on mobility, but he was still able to dominate the game. Such a big, powerful man. And... Um, like he's the, I suppose Jack Barry's there in midfield as well, and maybe Dermot O'Connor, but he was one of your last really old school midfielders like that. That was kind of a catch and kick, if you get me. And some of his diagonal deliveries inside, be it to Tommy Walsh down through the years or James O'Donoghue or even to the Gooch, were fantastic and always were uh, sympathetic to the forward, I'd say as well. He's had an amazing career, and it's great that he finished with an All Ireland uh, with his county last year and that he finished. Uh, on a high, personally, at least in Crow Park, with with his club, it is not, doesn't it make some difference for a club when you can, when you can just horse the ball in long <laughs> and Colin Finley will make something out of nothing. I mean, TJ obviously popped over popped over his place balls incredibly four sixty fives. They got five sixty fives, like that's rare that you get five sixty fives. The first one went a little bit short, and the keeper batted it out, or was it a defender batted it out? Could pandemonium for a split second, and I thought, God, are they going to have a, a nervy start here? But of course, they didn't. Um, but yeah, um, TJ probably not as influential from play as he has been in the past, but still excellent uh, in other ways. I and wonder is he carrying a knock, Shane? I, we've been talking of him carrying a knock. He definitely, I know he tracked back at one stage yesterday to get in a tackle. Him and Paddy Mullen got in a tackle. I think it was a free in actually. But he definitely doesn't look as loose as he did. I, I, I just, you know, he usually gets in through a lot of work. I just think, 
I don't know if he looks like he's 100% and it could be the same sort of case as last year where it'll come out that he get a bit of a knee operation after the club campaign last year only really came back for the for the Leinster Championship I think so I wouldn't be surprised if it's something similar um, and Derek Ling really really minds him uh, when he comes back OK well delighted to say that uh, Joe Canning joins us now how are you doing Joe? How are you guys? How are you, how are you doing? Not Good too job. bad. I'm You've wondering got what you think of when you see this, Joe. It's nice, yeah. It's very uh, 1980s, is it? Yeah, anyone uh, anyone spring to mind? Uh, Joe Cooney. The one and only, yeah. The one and only. 1-5 one yeah. from play. Was it 1-5 from play in the 1990 All-Ireland Final? I think he got, I, yeah. In the, yeah, I think that was in even the first half or something, was it? Yeah, you think so, yeah. We're delighted to have you, obviously, Joe, because... Uh, your your Laker game is being broadcast on TG uh, TG Carter on Thursday. Uh, highly anticipated. Um, had you much uh, nervousness about doing it? Did you need much need much coaxing to do it? Uh, a little bit, to be honest. Um, when they asked me first, I didn't I didn't say yes straight away. It took me a few days. Went back home and kind of asked the brothers and stuff like that what they thought. And I knew Ali had done one previously uh, back a f- number of years ago. Um, and I knew from the shows, there were obviously good shows, but I was just, I didn't know what kind of a story to tell or had I a story to tell or whatever and how it was going to go. And I was only after retiring, really. So, um, but yeah, I kind of thought about it and it was probably going to be nice for, let's say, my younger nieces and nephews that might not have seen me play before and hopefully eventually in years to come when if I have children or something like that it could be nice to show them in, in years to come so that was kind of the thinking of it more so than anything. And how much in terms of like the the storyline that we're going to see on Thursday have you seen it already or and how much uh, influence did you have in terms of how the story arc would go? Um, I've, I've seen it yeah um, the other day but not really it was kind of the director Cormac uh, kind of I went with him and he just kind of asked me some questions and what will we talk about this, talk about that. And I was fairly open-minded to talk about what I wanted to do. Um, there was nothing really off off record. When you retire, you know, you can't, you don't hide too much anymore. So there's a, there's a good bit of stuff that I probably didn't talk about um, before. And I know in the last few days, there's there's things coming out now that I've talked about so nobody will probably watch it Thursday night now and never out. Uh, it's like a new book coming out and you get all the juicy bits first uh, and then you don't so no like I yeah there's a lot of stuff from going back to 2006 2012 and 15 and stuff um, that I've talked about and yeah so it, it's kind of I don't know if people find it interesting or not, but I suppose that's that's what happened in my past, you know. Mm. Was there a reluctance, Joe, to talk about any of it, or did you realise when you're doing something like this that you know you have to talk about what Gerald Nan is saying about you, or you have to talk about the the county final in Lock, against Lock Ray or whatever it is that everything is kind of on the table. Um, yeah, like everything was on the table. I wasn't, I wasn't afraid to talk about it, I suppose, anymore, and kind of bring up happened really do you know what I mean um yeah I I didn't mind talking about it um as long as you know I I wasn't doing it to just to have a like I wasn't doing it in a bad way it was just that they asked me the questions and I answered them um because I felt now because I was retired from Intercounty I could answer them um so yeah that was kind of it was there always a reluctance when you were playing to hold back and keep your cards close to your chest um, I suppose because if you say if you say if you're nearly too honest while you're playing it's probably thrown back at you yeah like it's I it, obviously it, it, if you've seen some clips of the thing about even going back to Henry in 2012 like that taught me a valuable lesson of you might say something and and and, and say it in in a and try and say it in a good way but it's taken in a complete different direction uh, so yeah, I learned a lot from from that time and, and dealing with media, really, that uh, I found it very hard to trust them, really, to be honest, um, and say what I wanted to say after after that, you know. Um, obviously, it was stupid what I said at the time, but in the next sentence, I, I said I wanted to be more like them, to Kenny and Henry. So, um, But the media didn't pick up on that. They picked up on the non-sportsman-like part of it and just ran with that and... 
and yeah, as I said, I learned a, a valuable lesson that time. What, what, would there be any part of the this documentary that's coming out on Thursday where you were where you were watching it back and you were like, "Geez, that didn't come out the way I wanted," or are you very happy with it? Um, no, I'm, I'm I'm happy enough with it. Um, yeah, no, it's like there's only so much you I suppose you can get in in an hour uh, documentary, so. There's a lot of stuff, I suppose, left out as well. I was kind of, we done it like last summer and stuff like that. So I was even wondering like, geez, what did I say back then? And dad was a bit worried, I think, as well. What he, what did he say? Uh, but yeah, no, I think it was when, when I saw it there last week, it was uh, happy enough with how they, how they put it together. Hmm. And you've recently just been announced as part of the Sunday game uh, lineup and panellist. Are you looking forward to that? Because I suppose... You've, you've probably already done a bit of it anyway, so it's not completely new to you. So do you enjoy it? Do you like it? Do you ever feel like when you're talking about Galway, you're a bit like, geez, I have to kind of, you know, be careful what I say? No, like, I'm, I have to be, that's the job, you know. I can't be blinkered towards Galway. Um, I have to call it as I see it. And, like, you'd be hoping I don't have to criticise them too much that they'll go well in the, in the year. Um but apart from that, it's 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 a job at the end of the day, and and that's all you have to do. You have to call it go with the same as I call Tipperary or Offaly. Do you know what I mean? Um, and that's what you have to do. Would you look at things quite deeply, Joe Hurling, like uh, from an analytical point of view, statistically looking back at videos, games, and stuff like that? Would you have been? Is this something you always maybe taught or saw for yourself even while you were playing? Did you think quite deeply about it all? Um. I would I would have thought a lot about about games, but I, I I wouldn't be a massive fan of stats um, or how that's going. Um, I think that tells one picture compared to what's sometimes actually happening. Like you can't. I always go back to like a hurling brain. You can't put a stat on a guy that can see things happening before it actually happens. Yes, he mightn't be the fastest, or he mightn't get your 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 sprint um however way they they, they i suppose measure that like your your top speed or whatever but you're t- they can't measure your top speed in your head you know and i think it's going that kind of way that you're almost you're you're almost getting an athlete before you're actually getting a hurler nowadays um mm. and it's very hard to train a guy to be to have a hurling iq it's easier to train a guy to run 12 kilometers non-stop during the during the match you know mm. so, i would have found that about david tracy a little bit as well though he'd regularly have been at the back of the pack when it came to the runs but uh, to be fair yeah, yeah. he's very sharp very sharp with the ball uh, like so your involvement with the galway minor hurlers last year does has that kind of changed a little bit in terms of how you look at hurling at all like because i suppose you do have to buy into the stats to some degree um not really <laughs> no old pile of stats I think like they're my they're under they're sixteen years of age, seventeen years of age. Why why would you bombard them with stats about stuff? They're kids at the end of the day, and you want to just let them hurl and let them develop. Um, I I don't know about this thing about no. We use a certain amount. Like don't get me wrong, we've always used a certain amount. But I'm talking about like GPS systems and stuff like that. Like. Why would you throw a GPS system on a sixteen-year-old um, and have him worry about, geez, how far did I run today? Because lads can get sidetracked on that. Like I know guys that would have always come in after training and go, "Here, uh, what's my running stats like? Uh, how's my explosiveness today?" Or you know, and that's fine when you get to senior or under twenty or whatever, and you become an adult. But I firmly believe when you're a kid, you just let them express themselves and just let them hurl away and. And develop because pe- people are different you know mm. did you find joe uh towards the latter stages of your Galway career that a lot more time was spent on you know meetings and analysis did you find it was nearly too much like whereas when you started out like geez bless it was nearly really basic times almost like you you went and trained and you went home and it was quite simple whereas you know i remember brendan bugler saying when he retired from claire it was just it was two hours of meetings and things like this you were spending so much time not on the pitch, not hurling. Was that something similar in your own career? Uh, not really. I think, like, John McIntyre used to keep us for about an hour and a half just talk uh, <laughs> about himself. <laughs> uh, 
I know, <laughs> but like, but it's different. It depends on the management team. Like when Mihal was with us, it was literally 15, 20 minutes, and that was it. No longer. Um, you know, I don't know what the lads are doing now. Um, to be honest about it. Um, but. No, we never really, it was never really our too long, two hour sessions. Like you obviously have your training days and stuff like that, where you go on a camp or whatever on a, a Saturday, let's say, and you could be in Pier Stadium from nine o'clock until three o'clock. And obviously that's, that's where you get a big day's chunk, but not really in the evening times. I think Michal, when he was with us, especially we used to like, want us to get home as early as possible, basically. And and uh, not have a lot of talking, more more kind of action on the pitch, you know. Mm. Have you had a chance to see Michal's Dublin yet? No, no, I haven't. Yeah. I, I didn't. I followed a bit of the match, all right, uh, when they played Galway, obviously, it was interest, but uh, no, I haven't. Um, but I think it's going to be difficult enough with Miss, I think he's missing like 10 or something, uh, mm. here, and some big names as well, so... Um, don't know if he was expecting to lose all of them when he went in first. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting enough. Did you? Um, how much did you enjoy your club season last year with Portona? Uh, yeah, it was good because I missed the year before. Um, I played what the first first half of the first championship match, and I tore my groin off the pubic bone again. So I missed all the championship in twenty twenty one, and then last year, yeah, it was it, it was it was good. Like we won six out of seven games, um, got beaten quarter final. So, yeah, we have a lot of young kids coming along. We won the under twenty B there last year as well. So, we had six or seven of them guys playing with us as well. So, um, yeah, it was it was a good year for us. Yeah. Mm, and like, how, how did the body hold up last year, especially after the injuries of the previous few seasons? Uh, not too bad. Not too bad. Mm. I kind of curtailed a lot of the training. I wasn't obviously as fit as I could be. Um, is you're you're kind of minding yourself not to get as injured again um and then with everything that happened last year uh with man pass and i just had no growth for for hurling for a long time um so yeah i didn't but back training now on my own and stuff like that for the next couple of months before we get back with the club and looking forward to this year again with them Michael, was there any moment, Joe, in any of the Galway games last year, and thinking particularly the All Ireland semi final, where you're thinking, I'm sure you were there, be it in a studio or sitting in Crow Park, where you're thinking, oh Jesus, you know, could I have done this or could I have done that or could I have added this to it? Uh, no, like obviously when I was there in Crow Park, and it was, um, you were just wishing something but I don't think I would have done anything better than what the lads done on the field uh, it was just you'd love if they could like take back some of the misses I suppose in the first half and uh, and score them you know like they created so many chances but um, no I don't think I wanted to be out there you know um, I was content with my decision but uh, obviously in one like Physically, I wouldn't be able to be out there, right? But mentally, you'd love to be out there. So there's a complete difference in in uh, wanting to be there and, and actually being realistic and going, Jesus, I'd love to be out there, but like, I'd be wasted. I'd be an embarrassment to myself for a doubt, you know? Because um, I, I, I just physically wasn't able to keep up with the pace of the game at Inter County anymore. Um, and that's through injuries and stuff like that. So, yeah. Was there any particular moment when you in a game when you realised that? I'm just even thinking back to uh was it the COVID semi final? You actually ended up going off injured, unfortunately, the same day against Limerick. Um was was it against was there a moment against Limerick or against any team where you realised, geez, this is after raising another notch here? No, never like I was I was happy with where I was at when I was playing. But I was just going like, will I be able like it's it's still I'm getting older, my body isn't healing quick quickly enough. With the amount of games coming, like one, I think I broke my against Waterford and I put and I twinged my hamstring in the same game, in the league I think it was a league game in Pier Stadium, um, and then I had like a heel, the bottom of my heel was sore as well, and that it wasn't going away, and it was just stupid small injuries that 
I wasn't fully there. Um, so I was just picking up these like stupid injuries really, really easily compared to before. And I was like, sure, what's the point? Like, I'm not a hundred percent. I need to be a hundred percent to, to be playing at this level. And I wasn't, and it was just increasing and increasing. I just, I kind of got out before, uh, like, I realised that this could come crashing down sooner rather than later, you know. Uh, mm. so I just needed to get out of there. And that was that was only going to be a hindrance to the team and to the panel. So, um, yeah, it wasn't fair if I, if I stuck around um, for my own ego or whatever it was, you know. And the same year that you made your inter-county debut, I think it was the same year for Patrick Horgan, for... Seamus Callanan, uh, TJ Reid, and Shane Dooley, who was playing against Leash yesterday as well. Like, you'd imagine, would you ever have chats with any of these boys, bump into them or anything, and just find out, like, are they going through the same thing physically in terms of, like, trying to keep it, keep the show on the road? Um, no, no, I don't. Um, everybody's different. Like, just we're the same age, doesn't mean, well, the same year. I think we're all different ages, but... Um, like it all depends on the mileage you have on the clock. Like I, I started senior club hurling at fifteen years of age. Uh, I was playing on twenty one at thirteen years of age. So like I the the early years of my career was was stacked with matches. Like we won two under sixteens, two minors, and under twenty one if it's given club all Irelands. Whereas I, I no disrespect to them guys, but they didn't have that amount when they were that my age. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, so it's fine, say, geez, they're still playing, but like it, everybody's different in, in the mileage, and people forget, I suppose, they only think about the last maybe two years. That's all that's any, in anybody's mind. They don't think about what you've done 10 years ago, and that all comes back on top of you. Um, like I've had two grind off, two grinds off my two pubic bones either side, my hamstring gone off the bone my knee so i've had four four surgeries there in the last number of years as well so whether that comes from a younger age and just eventually catches up with me or not i, I don't know but it all depends on the miles you have on your clock from from a young age until when you retire and maybe also like because you'd be a fairly physical player over the years as well like taking the ball into contact at times and being out in the i suppose half forward line as well it probably meant an awful lot more physical contact over the years uh, it could, it could have, it could have. Like I, I didn't really break too many bones, which is funny. Uh, a couple of fingers, but that's about it. Um, but yeah, no, not not too bad that way, not too bad that way. Um, I think it's just running miles more so than that, and it just catches up eventually. Uh, is there any player in particular that you really enjoy watching these days? Um. Sure, there's loads like there's loads of guys that you really enjoy like it's you'd sit and wonder and awe on tj and how he's he's going so well that still i think probably taken over the gym a couple of years ago probably is the best thing that ever happened you know like the level he's still at uh is phenomenal um and he never ceases to amaze do you know what i mean um who uh, like on Cody obviously he, he is good um there's loads of guys but nobody really stands out really you know um i'll probably come off this now and i'll be there why didn't i say that way? uh but no like there's such a level now of 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 guys that are are really and there's there's loads of guys that probably don't get the recognition they deserve for unseen work like uh green mulcahy for limerick for instance does unreal donkey work and people just they only look at maybe oh he didn't he scored a point and they look at Peter Case and he could score five points and they go who's the better and they go keep Peter Case because he's five points but he mightn't have got them five points if Graham Mulcahy wasn't working his arse off for do you know what I mean? Uh so there's loads of people like that, like Wheelo with Galway like works his socks off. Um you know, so I'd be ra I'd rather look at them kind of guys that create for others rather than are just the guys that and it could be just a run it could it mightn't be actually getting on the ball 
it could be a run into space that creates a channel for somebody else and you're like geez his brain his hurling brain iq to create that without actually being involved is phenomenal and people don't see it um mm. so them kind of things that i i admire in a lot of guys you know mm. michael Joe, I might just uh, fire a few uh, rapid fire questions. Just it was just a question in from a viewer here, Jack Nulty. He just said, "Who was your toughest opponent, and who was the best player that you played with?" Uh, JJ Delaney, I've always said, is the toughest, probably. Um, the best player I've played with, um, it's probably two. Probably Ollie, uh, the brother. Have to kind of say him, like, and David Burke, or Galway. Um, yeah, Davy's still going strong as well. Yeah, like they, they, Davy has probably the best hurling brain in, in Galway. Um, and Ali was kind of like the, like him as well. You could they could see things happening before they actually happened, you know. Um, so yeah, them too. Uh, just another question in here from uh, Laura Bennis: Who is the best retired hurler not to have won an All Ireland in your view? You're, you're very happy not to be in this category, I'm sure. Uh, it's like it's a stupid stupid way of looking at things i think um like it, it doesn't make any difference to me whether you've 10 all irelands or no all irelands if it, it, um if it was an individual sport yeah you'd look at it and go fair enough but you need 14 other guys to help you win all ireland uh who's the best like like i've said ollie is probably one of the best players i've ever played with him Outside of that, uh, Ken McGrath, if I have to answer. Um, but do I look at Ken McGrath any differently than I look at TJ Reid, for instance? No. Or do I look at Patrick Horgan any differently than I look at anybody that has numerous all Ireland's? No. Um, yeah. One more quick question here from Michael Hennessy. Any regrets for not pursuing rugby? And another, this is, he also asks, why play golf left handed but take freeze off your right? How does this come about? Okay, uh, the first question, rugby. Um, I I would have often thought, like, Jesus, I would have loved to pursue it and do the professional thing, but I don't know if I would have been good enough. That's the other side of things. But I'd often look back and go, Jesus, that could have been cool to give it a crack. Um, because I played a lot when I was younger. Um, the other golf, uh, I play left because basically. My brother would play left when I was younger, so I just took his clubs. Um, and it, <laughs> and it's the hurling grip as well. Like it's the, it's the, it's the right hand on top kind of a thing. Um, I'm a right-handed person, so naturally to me that's the way it is. Um, but basically from from day one it was, Frankie the brother had a he played left sided, he hurled left sided, he played golf left sided, and that's how I kind of started off in golf. Yeah. And can you play on the other side if you want to? Uh, I actually push. Yeah, I put the other way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. What do you? And it's uh, I write right hand. It's I can throw darts either way. That's mad. Have you always been like that, Andy Dexter? A little bit. No, not. I'm not perfect. <laughs> like either way. Like I can't write left handed. Um, but yeah, I've always yeah, I've always been left or right. Like I kick off both feet, stuff like that. Yeah. Hmm. So do you do you play a bit of soccer on the side as well? No, I used to play football when I was younger. Um, with oh, the okay. Um, and obviously play rugby. I used to kick off both feet in rugby as well because I used to play out half fullback. Um. So yeah, I used to. That was more so that way. And what sort of handicap do you have in the golf? Or are you cooking the books and keeping the number nice and high? <laughs> no, oh, no, I'm definitely four now at the moment so yeah so i'm hoping to get a little bit lower this this summer come on please god yeah. last one joe because i know i know you're nearly your cough for time um where do you see galway as that now i know i think you've, you've comments this morning where you're saying a lot of people say they're in transition you disagree with that hmm. yeah I, I don't think they are like i think people probably look at it and go like they have a new manager or whatever but um I don't think they are. I think the the, the the nucleus of the team has been there for the last number of years. Um, but it's just about finding maybe one or two guys to maybe not even maybe start, just to come on and kind of finish games, you know. Um, so I don't think so. Though. I, I think Galway are, are in a good position. Like I don't think 
I don't think as if they're changing the team totally around. Um, like a lot of the guys that probably played last year were in now the panels for numerous years. Do you know, they've been in a senior panels for for five or six years. Like the, the likes of your Tom Monaghan and stuff like that probably nailed the place last year. Was in now, like he was on the panel for a good few years before that. Um, so there's a lot of guys there that, you know, um, so no, I don't like we're in transition or anything like that, yeah. Hmm. Okay, well, Joe, really appreciate you coming on the show and best of luck with the Lake Regale. Sure, it'll be great stuff. We'll be glued to it. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Cheers, Joe. Okay, brilliant to have Joe Canning on the show there. Plenty of comments in. Uh, lots of praise for him as well and uh, people enjoying listening to what he had to say. Uh, we didn't get to all of the questions. We would have loved to, but of course, we could only keep him on for so long. Has plenty of stuff to do. Um, where were we? Where were we before we went to that? David Moran, weren't we? Yeah, David Moore. Yeah, I think there's probably a bit. Is there a bit more from the hurling final that we that we need to go through? Like the fact that like we've talked we talked about the hur the, the club hurling final. We barely mentioned Adrian Mullins' absence, and it's, it's some sign for Ballyhale that they can win at the club all Ireland by by seven points in the wind up. You know, without probably their best player now or their most important player, I would say. Um, and with Darren obviously only only coming in. And on the flip side of that, then, it was great to see Brian Cody uh, coming in. I think he's actually off to Australia later this week. So they're losing Brian Cody and they're going to be losing Joey Holden now. Um, and what comes next from a Valley Hale point of view is going to be fascinating. But again, throw Darren Mullen back into the team. Throw Adrian Mullen back into the team. Um, they ain't going to be going anywhere for a long, long time. Um, hurling one to three forces. Mick, did you mark Joe at any stage in that club final? No, I don't think so. He's too busy chasing after Damien and Kevin Hayes. No, I don't think so. Uh, no, he was on Niall Claffey for nearly all of the game. Joe was relatively quiet in that final and they still beat us by 10 points. So that's that's not a great sign. Yeah, uh, this would have been a good one. We just didn't get to it, Paul Quirk, uh, asking, great listen to Joe. Does Joe think restricting the amount of age groups players can play would be a good thing? Sounds like it would help future Joe Cannings. I'd say so, yeah. And as well, I mean, this whole thing about if your county brings minor back up to eight, under 18 that they can't play senior. It's, it's going to be tough on some clubs. And I, I, there's been a series of articles recently on how it's been difficult for uh, certain clubs in smaller areas and amalgamations and so on and so forth. But, you know, you do have to draw a line somewhere. And as I've said before, if a team is struggling and they need a 17-year-old, surely they could convince a 35-year-old to stay on for one more year if it's just a case of keeping the club alive. But look, maybe, maybe not everyone agrees with me, so keep the comments coming in. Just on that, chain and, and Andrew's comment there, I don't know if I ever uh, told this story, but after that 2008 All-Ireland Club final, I was standing on the pitch uh, after, and uh, Liam Power, a great poor club man who had been involved uh, in the four All-Ireland Club successes, he was coming to the very end, I'd be very friendly with Liam, especially when he's a teammate. He just put his arm around my shoulder and he said, Jesus, this is the last time I'll be here. And he kind of had a tear in his eye. He was kind of welling up, and I nearly started welling up myself. And about five seconds later... Padre Whelan comes over, puts his arm around me, and in reference to my performance and the game, he just goes, Passed you by, Vern. Um, so <laughs> so I, hard. I actually I was taught I was like we all struggled that day, but I, I thought it was one of the few maybe that kept my head above water, but obviously not in Padre's mind anyway. Yeah, so Killian Corcoran here has to does TJ go down as the greatest after retiring? Now, based on the picture there, I'm wondering, is this Killian Corcoran who was playing cornerback for Shamrock's ah, yesterday? Maybe, you never well, know. Look, let us know, Killian. is it you? You had a good old performance and got He's on the score sheet over as well. a point from cornerback. Well, that was two cornerbacks scored from play in the match, and like you said, um, Joey Holden could have tried to pop another one himself. And that was a couple of Leaving Cert students. I'm pretty sure that both uh, Killian Corker and, and um, Niall Shorthall, who started in place of Adrian Mullen, are both playing for Kieran's at the moment. So keep the comments coming in there if that's you, Killian. Uh, yeah, oh, here, I think it's, yeah, harsh on, question yeah. on you here. Zero. He has, big, he has a big fat googie egg. He came in at the tail end. I came in at the wrong time. You could say uh, my arrival... Um, started the downfall of the club <laughs> yeah they, they passed the baton and then you dropped the bat <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, unfortunately not no uh, unfortunately not they all came before my time uh 02 and 03 would have been it would have been only 60 15 16 at the time yeah a couple of little bits of news that we haven't touched on um that would that have come around in the last few days Owen cadigan he's taken over to dungarvan senior hurlers 2023 pat gilroy and mickey whelan uh, Pat as manager taking over the St. Vincent's hurlers. Of course, Pat is involved with the senior Dublin footballers this year alongside uh, Desi Farrell, but he's going to take over the St. Vincent's hurlers. So that'll be a nice bit of double jobbing now throughout the next couple of months. 
Uh, three in a row, Leash champions with Clock Balacana. They've appointed Gary Myrna as their new manager. He's from uh, Thurla Sarsfields. Uh, Clonalty Ross Moore, they're renaming their club grounds in memory of the late Dylan Quirk, which is a lovely touch. And Pat, Lamine, uh, Pat Ryan, I should say, he's lamenting the loss of Mark Keane to the AFL. So he's heading down to, which club is he heading to again? Adelaide Crows. And um, I suppose Ryan said he was a fellow who brought a, a bit of physicality, good professionalism, and he was a great guy, very popular within the group. But we wish him well, and hopefully he gets better luck than the first time when he went over there, which was during COVID. I don't know if Pat would have been playing Mark Keane wing back against Kerry if he'd known he was stepping away after. So I'd say that was a decision that was only made in, in the last couple of weeks. Um Obviously, like he's just a big physical player, he's going to be, uh, he's going to be a bit of a loss. And like the chances of him resuming a county career when he comes back are probably going to be less likely, are they? Just because of the time out and then potentially going away, a lot will depend on how long he goes away for. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a, a lot, definitely a loss for the car carters. Yeah, look, I'm seeing a comment here from Finian Sheft and Killian here and Andy's can't wait to see Vernie and Gord. Now, if any of the boys are down in, in uh, Andy's at the moment and they're getting stuck into the pints, do any of you want to come live on the show? We will send you the link so you can join us on the show if you're man enough to join us. And you can tell us when we wrote you off and we backed you the whole lot. So are you man enough to come on the show? Yeah, if not, Shane, um, I'll try and do something with someone down in Gorham Park on Thursday. It's Tyeste, it's Chase Day in Gorham Park. The day that stops a county, so I'm sure the after party will be spilling over to that. And some lads could still be wearing the same shirt as they had on last night. You never know. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we'll we'll go back talking about the club all Ireland again if one of the lads is man enough to come on. If not, we'll stick to talk about talking about Tipperary in the in the Munster hurling league final and the defeat to Cork. Please come on. I know Tipperary were beaten, but like it'd be great to have a Ballyhale player on because there's a serious or a group of them. Beat. For you to wrap it on for the next half an hour of our Tipperary and go through <laughs> yeah. who was playing where exactly and oh I thought this lad should have came in and <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true well look it was Cork's day so Cork are back now I said Tip were back last week but Cork are back 314 to 119 they won down in Parky Rin so home advantage there that was probably worth a couple of points was it <laughs> I, don't, I don't know Del. you were you were eight up at one stage and it was kind of mad looking at the game I just watched the highlights back this morning definitely looked like you were in a serious position to kick on and win by five or six at least and Cork got a couple of goals and the whole thing kind of turned um a great finish from Brian Hayes a bad finish and then Conor Lehan played a lovely like really cool was on the end line could have maybe taken a real low percentage goal shot himself decided to, to spray it back across the goals and Jack O'Connor uh, finished it. It was a lovely, deft little right-handed hand pass from Patrick Horgan in the build-up for the goal as well. Uh, it was very, very nice. Um, and Horgan was brilliant. He was all his nose for that first goal when he followed in on the rebound from, I think it was a Declan Dalton shot. Uh, but you'd have to ask some questions about how Tipperary lost this lead because they looked like they were coasting home. Yeah, um, and Joe, you know Patrick Horgan playing 70 plus minutes, I think that's a big boost for him. Obviously, you know, as we were talking with Joe there, he's on the road an awful long time at this stage. So the fact that he could play that 70 odd minutes, maybe it's number one, a vote of confidence from Pat Ryan, or maybe number two, Pat Ryan is just trying to see how would he go over 70 minutes, but he seemed to do well. Um, yeah, like Tipperary got a great goal with Sean Ryan, he turned, won a ball, hand passed it into. Connor uh, Stakelum, Stakelum fed it back. Ah, Shane, that was a lovely play. goal. That's that's such a modern hurling goal. In look how fat, like that's what a hand pass was invented for. C give create space for yourself. Go back into space, and it was so quick. It was bang, bang, bang. It was a beautiful goal. <clears throat> um, good comment here from John Collins. Tip her back <laughs> at square one. I like that. I, I tweeted Shane, uh, retweeted your message about the show. Like if Tip were back two weeks ago, does this mean Tip are gone now? Yeah, look, it's not great. It's not great to lose an eight-point lead. And just on the goals, um, I would have said that the first uh, goal, who scored the first one again? Was it Horgan? So that ball that went in, and I suppose Brian Hayes was probably playing full forward. I just thought that, and maybe it's just getting used to full back again. That maybe Michael Breen came out to try and snap a ball that he just needed to spoil away to the side. Like I, I'd be very much in favour of always catch a ball if you can catch it. But when it's contested against the big man and you're in such a dangerous area of the pitch, you have to try and get it out in front of you or, or break it off to the side. So then there was also late on when you were saying that Patrick Horgan was involved in setting up the goal chance, you know, the the, the assist for the assist for Jack O'Connor. You know, um, Breen went to bury 
um, Horgan when he probably just should have looked to wrap him up. So look, it's easy to say it from the sideline and he'll get used to full back and be very good there again, I've no doubt. But Tip did, like they're starting to create goal chances game after game. Obviously the goal that they scored was excellent, but there was other chances for uh, for Ford and Bo. And I think this Tipperary team that seems to be knitting the play together a little bit better rather than just taking shots from 100 yards time after time. That'd be the positive I'd see in it. But there's plenty of positives for Cork in a week that they lost Mark Keane. Very good to get this win from behind because, like you know yourself, you're involved with a team. And sometimes you get a victory in a match where people, you know, outside the camp will, will, will not look into it at all. But maybe Pat Ryan will be able to hang something off this and say to the lads, look, it just shows what you can do when you want to turn it on. Does it show what they can do if they go a bit more direct at times as well, maybe? Um, and I know they had a big man in the edge of the square at times. Like I do think Declan Dalton is, and I thought it a couple of years ago, did he start against Dublin in, was it the COVID Championship in 2020? I think he started in a qualifier game and was effective. Um, I, I, I don't think they can go direct unless they have a player like that in there. Or um, a Brian Hayes, potentially, who's you know, a big physical player with a bit of a hand on him as well. But they went pretty direct. Um, just see a comment up there from Hurling Man. Can't believe TJ is gone. Um, there, there has been, you know, the odd little bit of a rumour going that maybe that he will, you know, bring down the curtain on his Kilkenny career now. I, it would be very strange if he did. Because he obviously, before Derek Ling was even announced as manager, he announced that he was coming back for 2023. Unless, you know, I, it's pure, purely speculation now, unless it's in the wake of, you know, an injury or being a father or something like that. But uh, I'd be very surprised uh, if he does walk away. Very, very surprised. So, uh, Liam B01 says, Evan Shefflin wants to speak to you. Look, Evan, if you do, uh, slip into my DMs there on Instagram and I'll send you the link. Oh, put him on. I have to say about Evan as well. I thought Ta Hoban and the lads were really smart in the club final yesterday. Uh, at different stages, Dunloy wanted to leave Killian Corcoran free and wanted to leave Brian Butler free. And Brian Butler actually went out to wing back to mark Evan Shefflin's man, man on the puck out. And Evan Shefflin stood in corner back and got a load of puck outs and he got on a load of ball. Like some of it some of it was, you know, really good deliveries. Some of it was uh, you know, maybe straight to the Dunloy sweeper. But I thought it was really smart way of getting around. Because we flagged that up in the show the last day, Shane, about what Dunloy might do and who might they might try and leave free. And Dunloy solved that riddle, um solved that riddle really, really well and solved it in game and got the players they wanted on the ball. Uh, a pleasure to read this comment out from Park Grace. Uh, Tip should adopt Millwall's chant. No one likes us. Actually, Evan, if you do want to come on the show, send a private message on Twitter instead. That'd be an easier place to give the, the link. Gwail Gore says, two tip schools in the Hearty final for the first time in 100 years, Cash and Thurlis. I'm sure you were delighted to see that. I, I tell you what, Shane, I talked about the Fitzgibbon being the breeding ground of, of futures, but that is a great sign from your point of view. Um, have, uh, well, have, is that Cashin's first Hearty Cup final or when was the last were they mm. ever in a Hearty Cup final yeah before? I think that's the first one yeah um, Dara Mason who may be connected with uh, is Dara is it no I don't think it's Dara that's involved in the Bally Hale panel um, that's Dean's brother says what's your thoughts on TJ Reid's retirement from Inter County well it's the first I've heard of it there is a Dara there's a Dara I think this could be just a big old wind up from some of the Bally Hale lads that are yeah. watching the show and they think <laughs> They'll think uh, that we'll fall for it. A pint of Bulmers or Guinness now having a good laugh, I'm sure. The two Egypts on our game now, they're going to fall for this one. Um, uh, James Daly said, I was in Tralee yesterday. This was for Limerick against Kerry when both teams were wearing green jerseys. Mad. It was absolutely Mad ridiculous. Stuff. It was ridiculously one-sided. Not, uh, not good for Kerry Hurling, considering who we didn't have. I thought they would have been much better. Uh, I'd say Bally Hale are, are having you on regarding TJ. Yeah, we certainly are smelling a pup ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's this now? Hurling man Killian, uh, Killian Corcoran has none to pick. With you, okay. As a, bone a, bone to pick, pick. a bone to pick, I'm sure. Listen, he wouldn't be, he wouldn't be the first, and he wouldn't be the last. Uh, just quickly on the on the car game as well. So Tip led one sixteen to to one eight. Uh, what did they score? Three points thereafter, and they conceded uh, what two six two six to three points that scored in the closing period. Definitely disappointing from a, a Tip point of view. Looked like they ran out of gas a bit, uh, and you know Cork were the team that were coming at the end and. Uh, Listen, Tip play a very high-octane style that's very energy-demanding. Pitch was very, very heavy. It was heavy in Parky Rin even the week before. So Cork maybe looked like they had a bit more of a bounce at the end. Um, 
Brian McGrath's performance, he was given man of the match from wing back. He got scored from distance at the start. That's obviously hugely encouraging. The display, I would say, Sean Ryan would be hugely encouraging as well. But I, listen, I don't think uh, I don't think anyone will be reading too much into it. One thing I did notice though in his interview after, he's a small man. Well, I didn't read that. Sean O'Donoghue is jacked for a small man. The size oh, he's a of the arms on him. He was getting like he's. I, I don't know if he's actually flexing. Mine doesn't look too bad there, actually. The Pythons. Uh, yeah, but he is. Um, he's a fairly all-action cornerback, and uh, obviously he's Pat Ryan's captain going forward for the year ahead. I don't think either manager will read too much into it. Uh, will re- read too much into that. But Tip will be a bit disappointed having let a lead go when they looked like certain winners coming down the stretch. Yeah, like it, just in terms of this other Munster hurling league game between Limerick and Kerry, twenty five points to nine, it finished. Uh, and like as we said, the jerseys were ridiculously similar. That shouldn't have happened. But um, I was just looking at some of the players that were popping points in that game. Fionn Mackesy, uh, like huge man, g- getting big scores. Colin Cochran with four from play in the second. He only half. came on Shane as well. He hit four from play. The exact like four replica points. They always say Billy Dooley got three replicas at the end of ninety four All Ireland. Colin Cochran's points were nearly all the exact same from the exact same position. But who is like it made me uh, think who is the biggest man in GA now? Because Colin Cochran is absolutely huge. Fiona Mackesy is massive. Um, you've obviously mentioned Sean Dunne who being a bit of a tank there, but obviously he wouldn't be as big as these lads. Grode McInerney would be in the conversation as well. It's funny you should say it. Two Kyle the, Hayes, Grode Hegarty. Yeah, but two of the biggest men in Hurling were marking each other yesterday. Tommy Doyle was down to play six for Westmead against Dublin and he went into the edge of the square to pick up Big Hedgeaw and it was like two, uh, like there must be the guts of about 16 stone, the two of them. It was just like that. Two, It's like two rugby players that run into each other. It's a, Tommy Doyle, in fairness, did get the better of the, they get the better of the duel. They'd definitely be up there. Um, I can't think of his first name. Is it? Is it, It's not Matthew. Um, McLean that played under twenty for Toronto. Oh last yeah, 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 yeah. Is a man mountain. Remember he did that handoff in the was the under twenty semi final last year. If he fills out anymore, like Jenny Mack, yeah, he's a he's a force of nature. Uh, Patrick Kenny says, "What size of Orga retro jerseys do the lads wear?" Mine is medium. I'd say yours is a small, is it? Go ahead, will you? <laughs> medium fits like a glove. When you have the Sean O'Donoghue who's on you, it fits well. <laughs> have you been pumping the iron lately? Not really, no. I just some days, some days you look better than others. I often find Dan Morrissey is mentioned there, and I have interviewed Dan in person a couple of times. Like Dan is as lean as anything. Again, he's another fella that you think this guy could be in on the Irish rugby squad. And saying that, funnily enough, he probably looks small in the Irish rugby squad, such as the the size in there now. Yeah. Anything else you want to add from the Limerick Kerry game? Like Pat Ryan was back in action, for example. Uh, David Reedy scored nine, uh, two of those from play. Mark Quinlan got three points. A very funny one yesterday. Uh, Pat Ryan went to shoot at one stage and sold a dummy in over the defender's head. And they're just watching Buff back. And he's like, oh, Pat Ryan. And then Pat Ryan went to pick and he's like, ah, oh, he made a bag of it. He missed, he missed the pickup or whatever. But uh, he was back. Barry Murphy was uh, playing again. Um, I I don't I can't really take much from a Limerick point of view. I have to say and I echo what uh, what James said there earlier. Like it was very disappointing from a Kerry point of view. Seven points. Five, I think or was it seven or nine? Nine. 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 Five Shane Conway frees. Two long range points from Owen Ross, both in the first half, and two long range points from Fiona Mackesy. Like like that that is a bit worrying. And it was the same yeah. last year when uh, they beat. Tipperary. I remember they beat Tipperary for the first time ever in competitive hurling last year, and uh, <laughs> they were poor against, uh, very poor against Limerick the next day again when Limerick were third string and Kerry were pretty much full strength. But listen, Kerry have bounced back. Kerry have been in the last three McDonough finals and will be there thereabouts again. It just is a bit disappointing that they could only put up a tally like that. They couldn't get traction up front at all in the second half. Hmm. Porter Porter said there's a lot of talk that bubbles will be available to be picked and is on a training program. I, I just wonder across the board, different counties. Who's the one player that your county could really do with having back right now? Like if Bubbles is flying, like you know, like his his fingerprints have been all over the last two All Irelands that Tipperary have won. If he's fit and flying, and there's good ball going in, he's a hard man to stop. Ah, yeah, he'd definitely be the one that would stand out from uh, from a tip point of view. Anyway, um, and just on along with Jerome well, Cal, yeah, Jer- Jerome obviously as well. Yeah, from a Limerick point of view as well, should have mentioned there too. Uh, two of the Mon Lean lads actually made their debut. So uh, they often misnamed Dunica O'Dalig and Jamie Power 
both uh, both came on for Limerick yesterday. So I thought this was an interesting one. So I kind of said that they had, I was kind of thinking they had to cut their celebration short from Mon Lean. That was the previous Saturday. So eight days later, they came in and played, made their Limerick debuts. But I wonder when did John Kiley ring them? And, you know, is it a case of, just John Kiley's after ringing me, okay, no more beer, if the two of them drink, like, do you know what I mean? You're just like, because not being smart at you, like Limerick opportunities don't grow on trees. Like the imagine it's been like, oh no, I, I'm okay. I'll say with the, say celebrating, and if you want to look at me later on or whatever, um, maybe that's grand. But this was an opportunity, and the two boys had to take it. And it'd be interesting to see if they see any more game time. But like as you go into the league, chatting Joe Fortune about this yesterday, the Westmead manager. Like really, I know the league, you know, doesn't mean as much as it did before. But say for a team like Westmead. How do you experiment in the Division One? How do you, like you can't really? You're going in against who are they playing? Clare, Cork, Limerick, um, and one more, you know, really high profile team. So from a Limerick point of view, they'll experiment to an extent during the league. But like these sort of lads, O'Dalig and Jamie Power, and maybe Marco Dwyer if he's fit to come in in time, you have a you get very very rare opportunities, so you have to take them. So I'm sure the boys jumped at the opportunity to come in with Limerick. Yeah, I, I think John Kiley's very much given his panel a chance here. He has a couple of regulars and lads who would be very regular squad members playing in these matches, but it seems for the most part a lot of the main stars are being left out and given every, every opportunity to be right for... I mean, potentially, are they even that concerned about the league? Last year would have suggested not so much. I'd say we're looking at a Limerick team that's going to be ready and flying for the start of the Munster Championship. Uh, the Walsh Cup, 12 and, wasn't it 12,500 people were there to see Wexford beat Kilkenny 125 to 218. Now, is this because there's such a hunger for inter county action after, you know, the split season does make that break that little bit longer since we had inter county action? Or is it because the opening of a new ground with the lights and all that kind of stuff down in Enniscorthy? Or is it just Wexford, Wexford people Wexford. are mad? Wexford Town. Oh, sorry, Wexford yeah. Town. Apologies. Yeah. Um, Wexford people are mad. They are a bit like they are a bit mad. I was chatting Tom Dempsey about last week, um, and he was saying like we, we are fanatical down here, and it's not because of success. He said because if it was because of success, like you know, we wouldn't have that much to be shouting about. Like Jen, Jen, when you go down to the year, particularly over the last, you know, since nineteen ninety six or whatever, uh, take out the All Ireland, take out the Leinster, and then take out the Leinster in 04 or 19, There hasn't been maybe, maybe that much on top of that, but they generally really get behind their county team particularly if there's any sort of buzz around it and there was a great buzz around this and like that twelve and a half thousand, they were waiting for a goal they were waiting for something to go wild about and that one one came at the perfect time just when they needed to win the game and they obviously were relying on results elsewhere so awfully making a big comeback to beat leash put Wexford into the Walsh Cup final against Galway next weekend and it's another game um, for I know you were very impressed with Charlie McGucky and I only saw bits and pieces of highlights but who were the kind of not to say that he's a new face because we saw him last year but was a lot of those lads that Dar Egan threw in last year Corey Byrne Dunbar Mikey Dwyer Charlie McGucky and Ross Banville were a lot of these kind of new faces there again yeah Ross Banville came on um Lee Chin only played the first half and he was popping over his freeze. Actually, interestingly enough, yesterday for the All-Ireland Club final, both Lee Chin and Darry Egan, the manager and... Uh, is he the captain, actually, of of uh, Wexford at the moment? I'm yeah, not entirely so, sure. Yeah. But anyway, two of the main men uh, involved in Wexford at the moment, they were both up doing um, commentary and analysis and whatever. Darry Egan was doing it on, on the radio in Irish. But, um, yeah, Chin only played the first half and I was briefly chatting to Darry Egan and I was just saying I was very impressed with some of these younger players, the likes of... Richie Lawler in midfield, like he looked really good. He was midfield and he was out working the ball and then he went on the inside as well. He caught one really good high ball. Uh, Charlie McGuckian seems to just get on a huge amount of breaking ball around the middle of the field. He's always an option out in front for puck outs as well. Turns and generally runs at the opposition and tends to do the right thing with the ball as well. So I was very impressed with him. Connor Hearn, who's obviously very good in both codes. We saw him with Shell Maliers a couple of years ago. He scored four points, very good. Oshin Pepper has another level in him as well. He got two points here. And Connor McDonald, who um, recently had a child, actually, as I see there on Instagram, he seems to be buzzing with that. But I'd say he's also buzzing with his performance. He scored four points. He also should have had a penalty, I felt, early in the game. Though I didn't quite get a, a clear replay of it. And then Corey uh, Byrne Dunbar thought he was very good when he came off the bench. So things are looking pretty good for, for Wexford at the moment. Obviously, this game doesn't really matter that much. But there are, like, even the likes of um, Ian Carty, he did some good stuff. 
Kyle Furman didn't play in this game, but a few weeks ago I saw him play well. So it really seems like they're bringing through a, some nice young players. The one thing is, again, these shots from 100 yards that we saw an awful, well, for years, years on years, I tweeted about it, and people are just saying, that's just Wexford for you. If they could just play the ball in a little bit more often and less than 100 yard shots, I think Wexford could become a real problem for, for opposition. How difficult is that a hab- of a habit to kind of, not beat our lads, but to get our lads. It, it is difficult. Like, you, uh, me and you kind of uh, went through that same phase of hurling, even in our careers, where the game totally changed, where mm. the, the grip it and whip it was no longer allowed. And I don't know if you got it, but I definitely got it a bit as well, where it did take a bit of adapting in your head, where I always played cornerback and you struck the ball, you know, 100 yards or whatever it was, and it was grand and you were a great lad. You, were you struck back. it 100 yards? Maybe 60. <laughs> 60 <laughs> Miss it with a half block on it. Um, but like it did, it hurling has changed so much. Whereas now you have to, and it's tra- it's ingrained into you now, you know, the 20 yard stick pass, the hand pass. Whereas, you know, some of these ads maybe are just so used to maybe being a mainstay on their club team where, oh, we need X, Y, or Z to be able to score from 100 yards. Let them have a shot. Whereas it just doesn't wash at inter county hurling unless you're Dermot Burns or Declan Hannon or you absolutely have it down to a T. And it takes a bit of ironing out to get our lads. You will not, generally, if you take eight of those long-range shots, if you score three, you'll be lucky, realistically. And, like, I'd even, like, even if I played it inside, you know, okay, you're talking about the return there isn't great, 37.5% return, which is really poor, because I think teams in general want 60, 65% score and efficiency. And, like, you know, maybe some, some lads are talking about, we need 40 shots a game. That's fine, but you can't have a quarter of them being from 100 yards because it's not sustainable. If that's your return, score and return, we'll say it's the three out of eight you're saying, I'd rather all eight of those balls are nicely played in front of the forwards. Yeah. Even if they only score four out of eight or even three out of eight, for a defender to be put under that much pressure with the ball going in and having forwards getting nice ball in. Like I was even watching a bit of leash and awfully yes, I only got to watch the early stages. And there was a few times that uh, James Duggan was making nice runs inside for, for leash and the ball didn't come. And, you know, you're, you're kind of putting in those, those heavy yards. Now it's, to be fair, sometimes points were scored, but I just look at it and I think I've played full back and cornerback and all that. And there's times when the ball doesn't come in and you're just so relieved watching it sail over your mm. head, whether it goes wide or over the bar, you're like, I was in bother here. Like, Is that better to... than shepherding the ball out over the line when you're oh. beating all ends up if it came in in front? Yeah. Oh, look, it's glorious. The amount of times you get let off the hook by a bad ball in is just... Yeah. Uh, it's so frustrating from a forward's point of view. I've never really played inside or anything like that. And if I was playing inside, they, w- they would be hitting the ball away from me. So I wouldn't be... <laughs> there'd be no problem with the dummy runs. But if you're making that run the whole time... You know, there's times when you know as a forward that you've created that bit of space. And when you don't mm. get the ball, it's a bit of a killer. And it's even more of a killer as an inside forward. If Some players might stop making the run because they... Like to think generally it's not going to come in because lads are more used to shooting from out the field. So I'd be the same as you. I'd much rather get, you know, uh, 65, 35 ball into the forward and have the forward who's obviously should be naturally a better shooter. Have him, you know, take a shot that should be, a, again, 65 to 70% shot rather than that really low percentage shot from out the pitch. Mm. Uh, just a reminder, we've got a couple of coaching clinics coming up a couple of weeks' time in Kilworth, County Cork. We're going to have Colm Spillan, Eddie Brennan and Owen Brislan. They're going to be there in Kilworth, Cork. So check the video description or scan the QR if you're interested in getting tickets there. Also, we have another one up in Derry Lochan in Tyrone. Connacht Gilligan and Connor Gormley are going to be there. So that should also be excellent. Again, check the link. And we're brought to you by orgoretro.com. Use the promo code RGAME and you'll get 15% off. Shane, you, you asked, you asked um, who is one player that counties would love to have. Colm Spillane is one player that Cork would still love to have. Um, and it, it's it's a shame because when he was fit and able to stay fit, he was such a robust cornerback. He was the, probably one of the, you know, the modern style cornerbacks. He was physical, tough. Uh, he was well able to mark. He was really good on the ball. He could score even if he got a chance. And somebody else came in with a good comment to Johnny Glynn. I'm sure Henry Shefflin has made several overtures to try and get him back in the Galway fold. But, you know, the longer that goes on now, what was his last game at Galway? Was it that Parnell Park game against Dublin in 2019? When me, I think it was me all done whose last game as well. I think that may be his last game. 
like as every year goes past, it does look less likely that he's going to play for Galway again. Mm, just in terms of the twelve and a half thousand showing up for that match, Park Gray says well, Wexford's All Ireland is playing Kilkenny every year. Martin Furlong says, lads, if Kilkenny and Wexford played each other in Tiddlywinks, it would probably be the greatest game of Tiddlywinks ever. Best rivalry in hurling at the minute in terms of game quality. Adrian McGrath asks, is Liam Ryan's accidental assist the maddest ever? A goal that could have been conceded fifty couldn't have been conceded fifteen year, years ago in hurling. So I don't know if you saw this. Liam Ryan had this was around. The hour mark he had the ball out around the sideline he went to play it back to his goalkeeper and instead it was cut out by bill sheehan who was obviously alive to the situation he buried it into the back of the net uh so but to be fair to ryan he was excellent for the remainder of the game he really stepped it up cash is king with a sneery comment here Liam ryan gave a brilliant pass into g uh bill sheehan for the second half goal richie lawler was brilliant in the second half Wexford are Walsh Cup specialists. Wouldn't read into it too much. They got absolutely hammered yeah. at, at Croke Park last year <laughs> they, by they Dublin. They got tanked. They got tanked in the final. I'm sure they won't want that to happen again. Um, but that was one of the great turnarounds last year. They were flying it in the Walsh Cup, hammered by Dublin, and then beat the All Ireland champions in the first game of the league the week after. Something none of us could have predicted, holding them to 11 points. But uh, it, it, I'd say they're probably right. I'd say Limerick, Clare, Wexford, Kilkenny are probably the two best rivalries at the moment in terms of game quality and how little there is between them. The last, probably, just really since Davey took over with Wexford, Wexford, Kilkenny, you could throw a blanket over the two of them. There's really genu generally only a score between them. Mm. Um, so Kilkenny in that game, obviously they had an awful lot of uh, new faces on show. Aidan Tallis was in the goals. Uh, you had um, Cody at fullback, Roe, Moylan, you know, a lot, a lot of names that people aren't all that familiar with. Uh, Tom Phelan, he scored 1-4. Keen Kenny scored two brilliant points at the start of the game. I think one of them, he was out. Like So if you're looking at the field up the top right, I'd say he could be no more than eight or nine yards out and he cut the ball over the bar. It was a beautiful score. He was playing at centre forward. John Donnelly got a couple and Niall Brazel knocked over five frees. Then Killian Buckley came on. Actually, Shane Walsh came on as well and knocked over a free. So there's a lot of new faces there that, uh, that have been worked with by Derek Ling. But I suppose when he has the Ballyhay lads to come back as well, what he's doing right now is seeing what sort of options does he have outside of those star players. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, there was plenty of new faces when I saw them in Callan against Offaly, and probably more experienced faces this time around. Uh, where he looks at players again is going to be fascinating. It looks like Parik Walsh is going to be playing wing back. It looks like Paddy Deegan is going to be midfield or wing forward, uh, one or the other. Uh, possibly. A Roman wing forward, basically, though. Like he yeah. won't be up there all the time. Kind of. I think he was named to play in midfield, so but he's. Like he has defensive instincts and he can score from distance, so I'd say he's going to be getting up and up and up and down that channel. Um, but yeah, the day so. of six forwards is is gone, and I'd oh, say yeah. even the the day of even four forwards, you know, at most. I mean, obviously lads are up and down all the time, but I think within the forty five, maybe even the sixty five, a lot of the game, you're only going to have two to three players up there now if you don't have the ball. Yeah, that's 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 the way it's gone, and you need serious engine and serious legs coming up and down the two flanks uh, in particular. And as you've said a couple of times already, it definitely looks even more pronounced this year than other years. It's very rare you look at a ball, you know, a rook type situation in around the fifty yard line where the ball's been in play for a few seconds, and you see, you know, if Limerick are defending, you'll probably see twelve Limerick players go inside or in around there, and a couple of players hanging up the top, you know. Uh, there was a good comment in there, Shane, about uh, about Johnny Glynn and when he came back for that league final in, in 2017. Um, ML89 says, you were you were on about huge GA players. When Johnny came back in 2017 for league final, he got so big, the jersey barely fit him. They had to put him on a plan to lose two stone of muscle and was still huge. I think Johnny is one of these lads that... Uh, some lads, we often had a few of them in the club, if they looked at a weight, they'd put two stone on, like a muscle, and they just get really big really quickly. He'd obviously been away from the game. They wouldn't have won the all Ireland without him. Like, I remember kind of breaking that story at the time that he was back, and people were kind of making a laugh of it, and how would it work and all that. And Johnny Glynn was huge in, in 2017. And in 2018, when they nearly did back-to-back, -back, he was there, he was plan A, B, C, and D, realistically. Mm. Uh, which was poss possibly to their detriment. Yeah. They should have mixed it up a little bit more. That's not Johnny's fault. Uh, Clare are light years away from Limerick. When was the last time Limerick disintegrated in an All Ireland semi final? Oh, it was 2013. Okay, but what I was talking about uh, was the Clare Limerick rivalry. They played, what did they play? Three times last year, drawing the league, drawing the round robin, 
draw and Limerick extra time win in uh, in the Munster final. And they have they played in the COVID championship in twenty twenty and were Limerick up a, or were clear up a half time. I think they might have been. Uh, I think it was very, very tight anyway. Limerick pulled away at the end, but they've generally been very good games recently. Yeah, um, Adrian McGrath is getting a talk to by River Power. He says, you really don't want Tip Strong again, but it's inevitable and can't wait to get back to you on it. Martin Furlong says, agreed that there's very little between Wexford and Kilkenny. Question is, though, why do Kilkenny seemingly struggle when they get out of Leinster while Kilkenny have gotten to two All-Ireland finals since 2019? Is there is there some sort of sense of Wexford always lifting himself for Kilkenny? But I don't know, maybe not looking past that, whereas I'd say without being disingenuous, I'd say Kilkenny are do look past Wexford and because they're used to competing at all Ireland level, um, you know, since the dawn of time recently, whereas Wexford not as not as much so. Yeah. Um let's move on to the Galway Antrim game, one thirty one to two fifteen. So down to Dunloy lads and probably another couple of lads here as well. And uh, it's not too much of a shock that Galway got the victory there. Um, or didn't see that game, so if anyone has any comments, please put put them in and we'll read them out. You were at Dublin's victory over Westmead, one twenty to fifteen points. Who played well in this game? Uh, a good few. Obviously, some of the experienced players were good. Owen O'Donnell was full back, very solid. Connor Burke was centre back, obviously very very good in the ball. Dara Gray wing back was strong. Of the newer players. Probably Dara Purcell hit two points. Davy Kyo is not necessarily a new player, but was probably the best player on the pitch. He hit one three. Now his goal probably I think should have been saved. Yeah, Noel Kennedy would have been disappointed with that. It was a good shot, but it was straight at the keeper. Um, I thought that should have been saved. He finished with one three. Uh, Keen Boyle had two points. Uh, young fella from Castle Knock. He, he went off injured then though, which was uh, a bit worrying, um, especially considering. That Michal Dunne, who said he was trimming the squad, they're working with a squad of the early 50s at the moment. So that's going to have to be trimmed fairly significantly. So it's going to be interesting to see who uh, who's who's in and who's out there. Um, you know, not that many. There's one thing I'd say to you about Dublin is, I was just looking at them. So they had Hederton at the edge of the square. And he's obviously a big, physically imposing player. And it's funny because Tommy Doyle was probably getting the better of him. Hederton got two chances and missed both of them. Do you know when mm. a lad, you know when you're starved the ball and you can't, when you're not really in the game, sometimes you get a chance and you don't take it. But if you yep. look at the rest of the the Dublin forward line, Janie, outside of Dara Gray and probably Owen O'Donnell as well, and, and Chris O'Leary midfield, there were a lot, it was a lot of the same type of players with the same type of stature, 5'10-ish, you know, well built for their size, fast kind of mobile players, but... I, and I just don't know. I didn't see much variety, shall we say? I don't know if I saw. I don't. I didn't see a ball winning half forward. I put it to you that way. Um, yeah. I you know I didn't. I I did. I don't see much variety or you know. Now that's that's a lot to do with Mark Shute probably not been there. Liam Rush is not there. I don't know is Eamon Dillon involved at the moment either as well. Um, there's a lot of players. Um, David Tracy obviously wasn't involved last year. He's not involved again. There's no Chris Crummy, who is probably that big, physical, imposing player I'm talking about, and there's no Keen O'Callaghan. So, I just be from a Dublin point of view, I'd be a bit worried that if you get me, a lot of their players are the same, and they say they don't, they offer the same things, but within a team, you need, God, I don't know how many different types of players you need within a team, but you need uh, probably a big workhorse, or probably two of them at least in the forward line, and then with your silky players, I'm just not sure if those type of players are there at the moment. And isn't that kind of, in a way, what we've said about Cork, that they have a, yeah. had a load of skillful players over the years, especially the forward line, and they're maybe just bringing in more of them. Now, Brian Hayes might be that something that's a little bit different. Maybe Declan Dalton being brought back into the team as well a bit more frequently. Maybe that's them mixing it up a little bit. But I know what you're saying about Dublin. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask you, where did Dara Purcell play? Because, you know, we saw him in the in the Leinster final against Ballyhale. He was absolutely brilliant. And... You know, haven't seen him up close. Uh, I know that there's a very good player in there. Yeah, he was in corner forward most of the, most of the time. And did he believe, stay in there? Yeah, well, pretty much. Yeah, and, and he I can believe, do that. Though. Yeah, I believe that's um, that's where he played all along. But that injuries forced him. He was out on the middle of the field for Crokes at different stages, wasn't he? Yeah, so uh, I think because Davy Crow was injured for that um, Leinster final, he moved out there. But he can play anywhere, really. Like. For the freshers, we had him at centre forward, we had him inside, and like you can more or less play him anywhere because he's so mobile and such a good hurler. Yeah, he clipped over two, Keen Boy clipped over two, uh, Donald Burke got three from play. Donald Burke is so good at his positioning that the positioning he picks up 
taking the ball from the receiver, the position he gets in. A lot of time it's actually behind the receiver. So the defender is the other side of him, but he's so good at uh he's so good at finding a yard. Um they ran the bench, they ran the bench at the end. Dublin were twelve five up this hit the first four points were twelve five up at the break. From a West Mead point of view, uh like they really, really struggled for traction up front. Um I think they kind of pulled the man back and allowed Connor Burke to sweep for Dublin, and no, they just couldn't get it. They couldn't really get on the ball up front. David Lennon's point in what thirty six minute first minute of injury time in the in the first half was their first score from play. Picked up an awful lot in the second half, probably partly due to the fact that Killian Doyle and Joey Boyle came on. Joey Boyle hit two from play. Here's one for you. I don't know if this has ever happened in a you know an inter county game before, but between the forty eight. And 50, 51st minute, Jack Galvin, the Westmead wing back, hit three points from play. Three points from play from wing back. The first one, he literally ran, ran, ran the length of the field. The other two were from distance. But, like, whatever about, you know, a forward or a full forward getting three in a row, or, you know, Donald Burke scoring a free and two points from play within a couple of minutes, a wing back scoring three points from play within, what, four minutes? I, I don't know if I've ever seen it before. And that helped to turn the tide a bit. Got the gap back to six points. But once um once Davy Keogh's goal went in, Dublin kind of just coasted home and ran the bench. Yeah. Uh, what was Shane Clavin like at centre-back? Because when I saw him against Antrim, before he went off injured recently, I thought he was quite good. Uh, Westmead ran the bench that much. Just give me one second now. Uh, just give me one second now. You'll have to give me a second. Just let me have my yeah, look I, at my reaction report. Here. I'm that looking at your report game. here. He came off after 55 minutes. Yeah, Shane, McGovern came in for him. Uh, he he was uh, he was okay, but Dublin moved the ball quite well around the forward line. Like Tommy Doyle had a Dublin played when they played direct ball in. It was in on top of Hederton and Doyle. Um, Clavin wouldn't have been on the ball that much if you're talking about. Uh, who was there? Darren Egerton came in at the end for them. They probably finished with their strongest team. Um, Clavin was okay. I, I put I put it to that way. But Joe Fortune was trying to uh, trying to run the bench as much as possible and blood some new players. I think he said six to seven of the team. Uh, there was only six to seven of the team that started against Leash last year in the round robin that played yesterday. So this is like a rare fact finding mission for him because they're going into a shark tank in Division One where. You're literally playing, nearly playing your best team every week, and you have to because they had a fairly chastened experience in Division One a couple of years ago, as awfully had last year, and that's the last thing you want going into Leinster. And so Chris O'Leary at midfield, I thought he was good when he moved into that area in the game against Galway. Uh, beautiful ball striker, obviously. I'd say most people know that, but if if the midfield is was it Chris O'Leary and Aidan Mellet who were midfield? Yeah, yeah. But they that, played that's... as is. It was one to fifteen. They played exactly as is. But that to me is, I mean, this this would probably be part of the issue for for Bihal Donahue this year, and uh, you know he doesn't have everyone available at the moment, so the team could change. But that's two lads who are probably not naturally midfielders who have been moulded into midfielders, so there could be a bit of a square peg round hole vibe this year. Yeah, O'Leary's an interesting one because he's from Cork as well, and it was just I was standing, um, I was just standing at at the tunnel. It was the gate as they were coming out, and it's just funny to see there was a. A Luke and Sarsfield's cohort there, and we're getting all getting a picture together. But it's just funny to hear the Cork accent from a, la- a fella wearing a Dublin jersey. It's just not something new. Uh, it's not something you see every day of the week. I'll put it to you that way. But he's definitely probably someone that can make a mark there. And again, he's a big physical player too. Yeah. Um. Awfully beat. Sorry, was it? A, yeah. Awfully beat. Leash two twenty one to one twenty three. Your club made own Cahill with eight points there. Uh, Brian Dignan and Charlie Mitchell got one one each for Leash. PJ Scully he got sixteen points, twelve frees a sideline. Uh, James Duggan scored one two. Tom Keys scored two, and a few other players scored a point each. So um, good. That's a good victory for for Offaly, isn't it? All the same, it maybe it doesn't. I mean, how instructive is it for the year ahead getting a victory in that game after the performances that they had in recent weeks? Yeah, I'd be encouraged enough, Shane, because then um, it was, you know, it was definitely a second string team. Um, when you looked at it on paper, when I saw it on paper, when they released it on Friday, I was kind of thinking, just, they've given a lot of lads, uh, they're giving a lot of lads uh, a go here, a lot of maybe uh, inexperienced players or squad players, and they looked in big trouble. Now they ran the bench at half time and brought in some um, more familiar faces, but uh, it was kind of Charlie Mitchell's goal after the break turned the tide. Like we looked probably dead and buried, you'd have to say it, and. That was probably another, like the tip game and the Offaly game were probably two cases in point of how hurling games can swing, maybe in a way that football can't. 
at just how you know how quickly you can get a flurry of scores and turn the tide and now that was a, that was a that was a no, I would have been encouraged enough. That was an encouraging win, especially when Leash had a Walsh Cup final place on the line. It's not as if it was a dead rubber tie. It was dead rubber from an Offaly point of view, but from a Leash point of view, they had a lot to play for. Um, and they will be disappointed going into Division One, and they're losing the lead against the side that's in uh, that's playing Division Two, albeit the two of them are in Joe McDonough. Mm, and the uh, the piss taking messages continue to come in here from the Shellminator with uh, a Paul Shelley image, Tipperary. TJ here, pretty sure it's not. Great show, lads. Got to go early on the live line with Joe to chat about my retirement. Will be explosive. Gloves off as I will stick it to Cody. <laughs> uh, Mikey K says, I think Joe Canning is right that the league is becoming meaningless. The Championship League is all that matters. Uh, the Q Cup, Kildare had a good victory over down 26 points to 15. And Meath v Carlo, 18 points to 111. Fitzgibbon, uh, just in recent days, UCC beat Maynooth 118 to 19 points, UL 223, ATU Galway 210. And then we've already talked about the, the Hardy Cup semi finals, but Thurla CBS 320, Middleton 27, and then Cashel Community School 112, Art School Reach 14 points. Then in the Barty at uh, the high school of Clonmel played Castletroy College, it was 221 to 123 after extra time. Uh, 24 players out of a squad of 37 were from Mona Lean, with the All Ireland Intermediate Champions having 13 starters. That's fair going. And then Hamilton uh, High School, 217, CBS Charleville, 117. And then also, if you want to look at that story from Tipperary Camogie. Yeah, obviously, um, Arlo Dwyer is well known and was well known for her exploits. Um, Camogie and football before she went over playing AFLW. She obviously won the Premiership medal there with the Brisbane Lions. But Dennis Kelly has her on board um, for the Camogie season. She was there was no big fanfare about it. She was just listed in the Tipperary squad for 2023. Uh, and that's interesting to see from a point of view of the AFLW season is tricky now, much trickier for players if they do want to come back playing GA. But that's obviously an agreement she has with the Lions. And Vicky Wall said recently that uh, not one of the reasons she signed with North Melbourne was the fact that they were going to give her the green light to come back and play with Mead. So they, she would be like this year. She left uh, for Melbourne straight after Mead's All Ireland final, and I'm sure it would be the same whenever they exit the championship. Hopefully for them, it's the last day of the year. Um, she will head over to Melbourne a couple of days there. But it's good that, and I think because of the fact that it's kind of semi-professional. There is, you do have a little bit of a say or a bit of pulling power in it, um, and it's good that they're, you know, getting their way in that regard. And while they might be, you know, over the far side of the world, that they're still getting to come back and play their first love. Mm. Uh, Jack Savage, he won't be rejoining Jack, uh, Jack O'Connor's Kerry football squad. He's heading back out to Dubai. This story was with the What's the Crack Dubai dot com. And his quotes were, I've had an incredible time over the last number of months between winning the All-Ireland with Kerry in a great run with the club, which Kerry so rally, and the mer memories I'll cherish forever, and so on and so forth. So that, that means one forward less for uh, Jack O'Connor to work with this year. And I presume he won't have the Clifford brothers for quite a while as well. So it gives other lads an opportunity, I suppose. Yeah, and David Morn uh, won't be won't be back too. So there's like from, from eight up, they're probably down a good few, they're probably down a good few players. Yeah. Uh, Cash King just says there's well, Sarah Rowe has gone playing soccer too. Uh, they're definitely good to the players. Like Sarah Rowe, I think, is kind of hoping that there's an outside, outside chance that she might end up on the World Cup squad. But she said herself it's an outside, outside chance. Mm. Uh, former Kerry football manager Peter Keane, he's taken over Kerry Legion for the second time. It's the first time going back into management since uh, finishing up with Kerry. Also, Ashley Maloney makes her uh, long awaited return to the inter county scene. She scored seven points as Tipperary beat Westmead 113 to 111 in the opening round of the Women's Football League. Uh, the McGrath Cup final was on over the weekend as well. Cork beat Limerick 19 points to 217. Stephen Sherlock with seven points and the same for Brian Hurley as well. Hurley got five of those from play. John O'Rourke also got a couple. Ian Corbett scored 1-1 one, one for Limerick and Keane Sheehan added four points all from freeze. Uh, the O'Byrne Cup Longford, they had a victory there over Loud, 3-13 to 12 points. Desi Reynolds with 3-3. Three, three. And one of the big things so far is Paddy Christie and his Longford team, they have really hit the ground running here this year so far. Now maybe they're putting out stronger teams than, than the opposition, but Sam Mulroy was still playing. He scored Six overall, two from play. But um, Christie's getting a great bounce so far with Longford. 
He definitely is. They're undefeated. They've played four games, one three. Uh, they drew one, um, and that draw, I think it was a draw with Mead, wasn't it, that got them through to the final. Just chatting a few people from from Longford and just about like I've seen a lot of names like Mullen Yachta names, like McGivneys that you that you would have you know associated with Longford a couple of years ago, but that maybe weren't involved in recent years. And it seems like one of the biggest things that Paddy Christie has been able to do, or maybe it was just a matter of circumstances or timing. He seems to generally have the vast, vast majority of players that he should have on the panel, that should that are good enough to play for Longford, seem to be on the panel. And it's in that half the battle. And it's funny when you're talking when Joe was mentioning there about Michal Donahu, like it is a different prospect of a Dublin that Michal Donahu was looking at to what he thought he was looking at. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like so you throw all those players, Rush, uh, Rush, Crummy. Shute, uh, O'Callaghan, etc. Ree McBride is another one that's not involved. You throw them back into the mix and you're looking an awful lot more optimistically about the year. Whereas Longford seem to have um, the vast majority of players that they want. There's only really one or two, I think, that aren't involved, that should be involved. And they've definitely hit the ground running. Mick, I said in the Thursday show, Mickey Hart's record, uh, be it with Tyrone or otherwise, of really going after uh, early season competitions is you know fairly well known. And... Desi Reynolds hit 3-3. I don't know if you saw the third goal, Shane. It was an absolute... Like, it was a serious, serious goal. But as good a finish as you see in June or July, uh, in January, is a fair goal at this time of the year. But a good win for them. Um, but everything we'll, go, we'll really be looking at. For Mana, uh, when are they playing for Mana? Is it uh, Saturday evening, I think, in the first round of the Division 3 League? And the O'Byrne Cup probably won't count for half as much if they don't get the result out of that. But again, a very winnable game, and Christie has hit the ground running. What do you make of this comment from Chris Conlon? Tip will come out a monster. Yeah, but Chris, tell me who's not going to come out. Do you know what I mean? Like, this is like saying somebody should have got an all star, but tell me who's not going to come out, Chris. Mm, yeah, uh, the McKenna Cup final, Derry three eleven, Tyrone one five. That's a that's a pretty good victory when you consider that Glen are obviously uh, you know none of their players were available. Not that too many of them actually tog out for Derry, but uh, that's a good victory there. But again, it could be a case that Derry have a pretty strong team out already at this time of the year, and maybe Tyrone aren't all that bothered. You know the way I talk about the horse terms of the little asterisks beside a team or a horse that there's a lot of improvement can come, or it's a P, sorry, for progression. Are Derry one of those teams where you just think, <clears throat> Jesus, there's a lot of potential for them to kick on? Like, I don't, I put it this way, like, I'm not looking at them with an ulcer as a fluke or that they're going to disappear this year. I think they're going to kick on a step or two. Am I, like, what do, what do you think? I think all the potential is there. Yeah, I think they can, but I mean, they were very disappointing in the All Ireland semi final last year to not even drop a few balls into the square where Galway looked a little bit, yeah. you know, suspect in the previous uh, games. Uh, yeah, I, I know, I do think they can kick on because, you know, it's another year, an another kind of pre season of, of working on the game plan and so on and so forth, and probably developing some of the players that they have there. But if they can go beyond having 17 and 18 players, they, they, they trust that's a big part of it. Your little doggy is behind you there. Bring him into the shot. Is he? Oh, I see him there. <laughs> he needs a he needs a walk now. Very lively. He's been stuck in the house for the last couple of hours. I walked him before we started doing our, our research for the show, but uh, he'll be out in a couple of minutes, or she'll be out in a couple of minutes. She'll be grand. Yeah, and the the FBD final as well in Connacht. Ross Common thirteen points. Sorry, eight points. Mayo thirteen. Late scores from Killian O'Connor and Connor Loftus nudged Mayo to their uh, first Connacht title for ten years. At this level, I believe Conor Loftus is playing centre back. Yeah. What do you make of that? Yeah, it's a strange one. Like he would have started. Uh, he been an inside forward or a half forward at the start. When he very when he uh, first came on the scene, I think he was an inside forward. I think he's then... an inside forward. He's gone from inside forward to half forward to midfield to hmm. centre back. Um, Full back soon. Yeah, goalkeeper. Why not? Uh, let's. Know. Guys, did you always wear helmets before the rule changed? Just interested. Most of the time, yeah. I remember one or two, one training session in particular, I just took the helmet off midway through. Maybe it was one of those warm summer evenings or something. And then there was a tackling drill and one of the lads went to run past me. And you know the way sometimes a lad kind of hits you there in the arm and it makes your arm come around like that. Sure, didn't I bring the hurley around and came all the way around and just split my eye open. So, you, so, was... so basically you hit yourself. It's like when you, I love doing it when you grab somebody's hand and particularly, you know, you know, a child or someone, a nephew or something like that, and you start slapping their own face with their hand and you're like, why are you hitting yourself? Um, 
I my eyes would never have been hectic, so I always wore a helmet because it was my mother had it bet into me. She said, "You wearing your helmet today?" So I I always. What do you mean your eyes aren't hectic? Aren't my hectic. my eyes wouldn't be hectic. Like I probably should be wearing glasses or something like that. <laughs> um, there's a what's actually don't. There's another thing actually for cracking a warm up. I like doing this thing where okay, so I put up my two arms like that. You grab both of my wrists. You, we obviously both have helmets on, and I have to try and slap oh, you yeah. across the head. Great. That's the good one. You Get can me. do that for the knees as well. Slapping the knees, ties, yeah. anything like that. Good old crack. Anything where you get a crack at a lad is always good crack. Yeah. Um, let's see. Did you have a black and white Cooper at one stage, Vernie? White Cooper at the front mixed with a black Scanda. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't get the couldn't get the I had a lovely wine cooper oh lovely I remember I bought it when I was about 14 and uh, it got robbed at a match one day oh Jesus I, I I actually anyone that's familiar with Offaly I went to the Clara Market where items like that would might turn up if they were taken I went to the Clara Market for the next four Sundays and no sign of it so unfortunately it never never appeared again uh, some of the latest Sigerson results, DCU 314, Queens 5 points, St. Mary's of Belfast 110, ATU Sligo 6, University of Galway 211, UCD 16, and MTU Cork 314. Manus, I'd like to make a statement. I have my goal of the week. I have it prepared. I was just going to say, surely I'm going to blindside you with the goal of the no, week. Go ahead. No, goal of the week is Desi Reynolds. 3-3 three, three from play. Uh, as Longford won the O'Byrne Cup, uh, it was a fair old tally. And I'm going to challenge you to for a football goat and a hurling goat. I go football goat. Jesus, on mm, I give Joey Holden the goat of the week ah, in the man. hurling good on man. the hurling side. Football side's that bit tougher. Um, I haven't a clue. The Ferris really wheel. Have. Connor Ferris. Yeah, it has to be Ferris wheel. Yeah, good call there. Jeez, why didn't I think of that straight yeah, away? I'm actually going to give I'm going to give Joey Holden the man of the match as well, which Owen Cody most certainly will not like, given his job to teach a catter after the final yesterday when he said, "Are you sure this isn't for Joey Holden?" Because everybody had said after the semi final that Joey Holden should have got man of the match, probably including both me and you. But uh, yeah. I'm sure he'll take it well. And a reminder that we're brought to you by orgoretro.com. Use the promo code OURGAME and you'll get 15% off. We also have a couple of coaching clinics coming up in the next few weeks in Kilwart County, Cork. Colm Splann, uh, Eddie Brennan and Owen Brisland are going to be in Kilwart, Cork. Check the video description for links to the tickets there. It's going to be a brilliant day. And the same up in Derry Lochan in Tyrone. Connick Gilligan and Conor Gormley are going to be there for that. So that's it for the show. If you want to get the audio pod podcast and plenty of other exclusive content, it's over at patreon.com forward slash our game. Michael, we've it all said. We have indeed. See you, Jeno.